Awesome. Happy Sunday, everybody. Hope you're having a fabulous day. Uh, Kyle Curtis here with Steve McRae, as always, and David. Hello, guys. Uh, Steve McRae with the fabulous hair. You forgot. I knew that was coming. Yeah, I knew I, had it. To. I, he, I told you uh, it would be just. I, I wish that looking back, I had given uh, Dave your salon photo because that would be great to, to transition from. But yeah, you already showed it. In, <laughs> you already showed it in Twitter. Um, happy Mother's Day, too, by the way. Happy Mother's Day. Forget, don't forget that. Talk yes, absolutely. Time. Happy Mother's Day. And then uh, joining us, the naked Mormon himself, Bryce Blake and Nagel. How are you, sir? I'm uh, fully clothed and quite well. Thank you well, so this much is for having me. Disappointing, then. I know, I know. I, <laughs> when you guys said there was going to be video, I got a little nervous because that's not my usual mo. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Happy Mother's Day to you and to everybody on the stream as well. Excellent. Well, um, I'm I I'm excited to hear where the. Uh, where the idea for the name came from, and we'll get into that um, in just a second. But first, as always, a couple of uh, quick announcements to update you guys for what we have coming up during the week. Um, tomorrow is going to be the Legion of Atheists versus the Jesus League. That stems from the uh, questions that uh, no Christian can answer that we put out probably about two weeks ago. It stemmed a lot of controversy within the Christian community, and we've gotten a bunch of them together probably Seven, I think, total are going to be coming on, along with the people that you saw in the video. They will be all joining us tomorrow to hash it out and go over the questions and kind of see where we can line up. Even on the Christian side, there are several different views, several different angles that um, they are going to be coming from. So it's going to be a really interesting um, show, to say the least. Uh, we also, on Tuesday, are going to be talking about uh, censorship. That's with uh, Bunty King, who is a very funny uh, YouTuber. And then uh, on Wednesday, we are talking about uh, The Covenant, which is a book put out by um, Bernard uh, Laborel. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, but he, he wrote a, a book that kind of goes into maybe religion stems from – the Abrahamic religion stems from a actual king who was uh, made a deity – and that's where we kind of it kind of trickled down. It's a very interesting book. I'm I'm almost finished with it completely. He'll be on on um, Wednesday to talk about that. Uh, uh, Thursday going to be a good stream. We have uh, Godless Engineer joining us, and he will be talking with uh, allegedly Dave, who is a flat earther, a sovereign citizen, um, and is a proponent of urine therapy. And um, I'm not sure where we'll start there. But uh, we'll, we'll we'll go through all, <laughs> all of those. Uh, and then lastly, just so you guys know of some things coming up, there was a guy who uh, – it was a Pathios article that came out about six days ago uh, named Matthew Powell. He was the subject of this article. And uh, Matthew Powell got some notoriety for uh, – he's a – like I guess he's an associate pastor of his church, but – he did a sermon one Sunday. It's on. Um, you can go to his channel and and look at the the clips yourself. But he went on a rant about how atheists are stupid and it's because of video games and that all we do is play video games and drink coke. And um and then following that, I noticed that the the video that he he had an interview with Skylar Fiction. That video in that video he claimed that um, homosexuals and unruly children should still to this day be put to death. So. We're having him come on um, and to cover both the issues, both the gaming issue and the um, the killing of homosexuals and unruly kids. We've got two very special YouTubers, two very big YouTubers that are going to be joining us. First, Rags, who is um, a, a well known for his his gaming um, channel, and then Bionic Dance, and they're both going to be joining us Sunday to have a little conversation with Matthew Powell and see if we can't uh, change his mind on that. On the 25th, David Smalley, who is the host of Dogma Debate, a, um, a really awesome podcast where he, he does similar things that we do. Um, he's going to be having a conversation with Capturing Christianity um, on his channel. And then lastly, we said last week, last Sunday, when we had uh, Telltale Atheist and Lloyd Evans on, that it's really hard to find a Jehovah's Witness that's willing to come on to try to defend the things that you know were being said and, and that kind of thing. Well— um, Telltale has notified me yesterday saying that he has one willing to come on to to do just that. So really big show on the 30th. Um, that's that's a Sunday, I believe. No, that's a that's a Tuesday, I think. But um, Telltale Atheist Lloyd Evans will be joining us 
at eight o'clock to actually have that conversation with a Jehovah's Witness. Okay, um, I'm gonna th throw it to Steve. Uh, it's an interesting show tonight because we have three actual uh, former Mormons with us. We, David's one, Steve is one, and then Bryce, of course, is one. So, um, Bryce, I tell you what, you want to go ahead and um, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you, and then um, we can kind of go into it from there. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, just I, I guess I'll just kind of walk up a uh, very, very brief synopsis. So, I grew up, uh, I was what was called born in the covenant. So, I was born in Utah in the church. Um, the covenant, of course, is a uh, sealing covenant. Um, families are sealed together forever, and I was born inside of the covenant of a sealing marriage. And I grew up in Utah, what we call Morador. It's the Mormon corridor from, uh, you know, Idaho to Utah to Arizona. And uh, just very average life. I had a really, you know, uh, I call it a charmed home life and never really had any problems that I had to deal with. Uh, never, um, I, I do have to acknowledge oftentimes when I hear a lot of uh, stories of ex-Mormons uh, that they had hard transition stories, I have to acknowledge that I was quite privileged to have a, a fairly easy hand it dealt to me. Uh, so I stopped attending the church when I was about, you know, 16, 17 years old, and that was just out of apathy. And then uh, a few years later, I started talking with a, a friend of mine who was Christian, claiming that Mormonism is not Christianity. And uh, it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, of course, yeah. it's Christian, right? Uh, but Agreed. it's it's always the no true Scotsman fallacy when it comes to Christians debating against Mormons, debating against Southern Baptists, you know, uh, fill in the blank, right? So... Um, he gave me some resources on Mormon history and Mormon theology and deeper doctrine that I wasn't aware of even as a member and said, you know, consume this and then we'll, uh, we'll talk again. And I started looking into Mormon history and I caught the bug as genealogists often say. And ever since, you know, for, for about six years now, five, six years, I've just been studying Mormon history nonstop. I can't get enough of it. And three and a half years ago, I started the Naked Mormonism podcast because, I was looking around for a podcast uh, that, you know, deconstructed Mormon history from episode one starts with the birth of Joseph Smith and it just moves chronologically from there. And the episode, the podcast didn't exist. So I figured I'm just going to make it if I want it, then I'm, I better make it. So uh, and here we are. And yeah, that's it <laughs> three and a half years later. People, that's fun. It, it's hilarious that people kind of um, they'll, they'll use like Mormons and Catholics for their bloat their numbers when they talk about Christians and they say, oh, well, you know, Christians. Uh, and then, and they include them, except when they don't want to include them as being Christians. Yeah, it's odd. Right. It's really it, odd. It, they do it all the time too. It's like, wait a minute, make <laughs> up your mind. If you if you don't want to believe Mormons are Christians, that's fine. If you don't want to believe Catholics are Christians, hey, nothing more power to you. I think it's stupid. Of course, you know, I may not believe in either one of them, but they are Christians. That's just reality. It's one but, of the only religions with Jesus in the name. Yeah, yeah, right. it, yeah it, it's so funny because even. Um, the other day, who was it that was talking about, look, at, there's only a handful of religions that do this, and Christianity, and especially Mormonism, and some other things. And yet, you have people out there that just because they don't like the particular doctrines and tenets and things like that, right. they're not Christian. I'm like, then what the hell makes a Christian anymore? I'm confused. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it always diverts down to that no true Scotsman, right? Exactly. Yeah, and, and everybody has the one true religion, So, and you have to just go All to the next church to find out what's wrong with every other church. Yeah, if you don't like one Mormons, true religion, go to the next one down the street. You'll exactly. Out. Yeah, well, and Mormonism is really good at that because at the foundational core story of Mormonism, we have Joseph Smith in the Sacred Grove in 1820 at the age of 14 years old. Obviously, there are a lot of holes from what I said already concerning the historical record, uh, but he claimed that jo uh, Jesus and uh, God descended in corporeal form and told him that all the religions are false and all their professors are corrupt and that you need basically to start your own religion. And that's what he did. So, I mean, right off the bat, the Genesis story of Mormonism is all the other Christianity that's out there are wrong. So I'm going to make my own. So it's wild that it's wild that it, that it, it kind of caught on. We'll get into that, how it kind of caught on. But why the naked Mormon? What, where did that, <laughs> uh, where did that He's come really from? focused on the naked part more than the Mormon. <laughs> <so you can laughs> tell. I see. Um, I, I, priorities. Okay. Yeah, uh, priorities. <laughs> So okay. honestly, what what I was trying to do uh, when I decided on naked Mormonism, I was deciding what is something that is inflammatory that might share some uh, some you know overlap with people that are searching porn, and I thought this 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 is a great title, and and actually no. <laughs> so wait, they're searching for porn and they end up on your channel. 
I okay, okay, so I just okay. I just ran the uh, the numbers last week. Uh, I had just to see where my uh, my podcast uh, website comes up in search results. Turns out when people search for naked Mormons, I'm like the second thing that comes up on Google. So yeah, how did we think awesome. of that? We could have see the naked <laughs> non sequitur show. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, we might have to do a name change. Yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> but no, to be honest, though, like what the reason why I did it is because I'm I'm doing my best to strip away all of the biases, strip away all the correlation and all the whitewashing that's happened over the church's history, and try and view it from as unabashed and honest uh, perspective as I possibly can. Now, obviously, there's there's a lot of problems with that because. No analysis of any subject can be truly objective. Everybody has skin in the game, and, and especially when it comes to religion, it becomes even harder to be you view it objectively. And myself, I grew up in the church, and I no longer attend the church. I call myself secular Mormon as opposed to ex-Mormon, as I used to call myself. And I have biases, and I have to acknowledge those biases, and I try to do so as frequently as possible on the show and say, hey, this is my opinion based on everything I've presented so far. But you know what? You're the listener. You, you you use your skepticism and make a judgment for yourself. I'm not here to tell you the fact, or I'm not here to tell you what is unequivocally true. I'm here to tell you the facts and then my thoughts on the facts. So, yeah, naked, unabashed, honest look at Mormon history. Do, do you right. notice the difference between people that were, quote, born in the covenant and, like, someone like myself that was a convert? I converted when I was 17. Do you notice that there's a, a, a – there is a strange – difference between the two. I, I know it sounds weird to people that have never been in the Mormon church, but if you're born into the church, there's a different feeling you have than the people that converted. Do you, do oh, you notice absolutely. that? Yeah. And I found oftentimes it, it seems counterintuitive, but people who are converts are often more firebrand about defending yes, their faith. I agree. So with that. Uh, people who are born in the covenant, it's just part of your everyday life. You know, you don't ever question it. You don't ever think about it, but people who converted they went through the logical steps to get themselves to convert, and therefore they have they've thought about the church in the abstract more than people who are born in the covenant. And I think that does force them to come to a more nuanced perspective of belief in the church. But that isn't without its drawbacks as well, because if you're born in the covenant and you have you know blue pioneer blood running through your veins like myself, then you're seen as like oh that's. That's a really, you know, that's obviously a righteous uh, Mormon right there. He was chosen to be born in this last dispensation when the world is falling apart because he has the strongest spirit of all of us. Uh, so you, there's a stigma that comes along with being born in the covenant, especially if you have pioneer blood. And uh, th that doesn't exist for converts as well. So it's a give and a take both directions. Yeah, well, one of the things in the LDS. Oh, I'm sorry, Kyle. Do you want to say something real quick? Uh, well, you, you can go ahead and ask your question. What I was going to do is is dive into the the difference or what makes Mormonism stand out, so that everybody's kind of on the same page. But if you have something relevant to that, yeah, I was just going to add that uh, one of the things in, in LDS theology is that the Latter Day Saints, whether they call Latter Days, is because what he just said, the spirits had waited toward the latter days to be embodied. And yeah. so is that the 1800s and the 1900s, the, the 2000s? When when exactly is the latter days? Nobody actually knows. But yeah. uh, that's why they call the latter -day saints. If everybody asks why it's the Church of Jesus Christ of the latter -day saints, it's because we they believe we are in the, quote, latter days, not a rapture. But the spirits now are the, the, the ones that were more vigilant in the preexistence. And it is interesting to draw an, an equivalency here because uh, just like Jesus preached um, his apocalypticism, that there are people who are here in front of me today who will not pass away before the second coming of the Lord. Joseph Smith preached the same to a number of his his you know upper trusted Mormon elites as well. And it always seems like apocalyptic preachers are viewing the apocalypse coming within the next day or the next few weeks. But oh, yeah. then they die, and then uh, they're you know separated from modernity by a couple centuries, and it's like, oh wow, so it still hasn't happened. We must be really in the latter days now. Yeah, it 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 kind of keeps evolving into a a, a bigger, you know, a bigger time frame. But yeah. you in the past, I mean, what the, this past century we've had countless from different uh, religions and, and faiths and cults saying that uh, the the end of the world's coming, you know, next October, next March, and it just keeps getting. getting pushed back. So I think it, it, it's like you said, we're always living in the in the last days. And as we yeah. keep moving further, it, it's more and more in the last days. And but I do what, find it interesting just to, to piggyback off of that sure. a little bit, too. So uh, a lot of times uh, religious faiths, uh, Mormonism included, will use um, 
wars and pestilence and natural disasters to claim that we are indeed in the latter days. We, you know, it's, you know, we're seeing such an increase in, you know, natural disasters and people are dying by the thousands when a tsunami breaks on, in some third world country. And, uh, you know, there are more wars than there have ever been, which, I mean, all of those things are just uh, unfortunately ignorant of <laughs> world events. Um, and and it, if we zoom back and, and we view the data on a larger scale, we do see that there is a trend towards peace as as the world currently stands. Um, if you factor out World War One, World War Two, uh, which obviously those are massive conflicts, if you do take them out as statistical outliers, then we have been on an incredible trend towards more and more peace over the past, you know, it, well, I could say the past hundred years could also say the past 200 years, past 500 years that we have documentation of, you know, unequivocal historical documentation of. So, uh, but in, in the history of the church, so the history of the church was, uh, compiled and published, uh, prior to Joseph's death in 1842. And it's a seven volume series. Of course it was printed in the, the church's pamphlets back then, but in reading through the seven volume set, you see every couple of pages, they say there was a massive earthquake in China. Uh, there was a typhoon over in Tahiti. Like they, they talk about these natural disasters and these major cataclysmic events as if that is signaling that the end is nigh. And they, they and it's always followed up with some kind of thought, you know, some kind of opining from whoever is recounting the history that we are truly in the latter days and the Lord is nigh at hand. And you yeah. realize, well, those things have always been going on. We just uh, there was more circulation of, of documentable evidence back then. Than there had been prior to that and there's more circulation of it now we're just a lot more cognizant of natural disasters occurring now because we can see video of it have Absolutely. you seen hawaii have you seen hawaii it's got to be the end times dude that's yeah right. right yeah <laughs> that's incredible stuff though the, those the, the the video of it coming across the road and oh that dude i've been following crazy. that up uh, yeah incredible. that some i i feel sorry for anybody that's living in that area right now Absolutely. because they are definitely in the path of destruction yeah uh, so let's, as are we all because it's the end times <laughs> yeah. I had an earthquake here the other night. Seriously, it's like 4:40. I was like, oh, I was like, oh my god, just second coming. Um, yeah, right. And you know, I was uh, when I was living in Colorado before I moved to Seattle. I, I experienced the first ever earthquake I'd ever felt before, and it, it was you know just a very very minor, but it just sitting you know working on the, the laptop and uh, just felt the house shake a little bit. I was like, that was that was an earthquake. Holy crap! Uh, you know. The, uh, you know, we can say, oh, well, obviously the end times are nigh at hand, or we can also point to all of the, the massive fracking units that surround the entire area in that area in Colorado and be like, oh, well, maybe they're just, uh, you know, all the, the hydro fracturing is causing, you know, the place to be lubed up and caused, you know, micro tremors. So, uh, yeah, maybe there's naturalistic though. explanation. That's inconvenient. Yeah. <laughs> it's inconvenient to view it through a naturalistic lens, isn't it? What's the, so let's go into um, kind of a, a brief synopsis of, of what Mormonism is and what makes it uh, – what sets it apart from uh, other religions and you know most importantly Christianity because you do hear all the time people saying, well, Mormons aren't Christian. And so why would they – why are they saying that? What's the things that, that kind of separate and, and make it distinct? So the claim is that Mormonism – does not hold to the tenets of a typical Trinitarian Christianity. And I will argue all day that Mormonism is Christianity because if there is any religion professing to be a Christian sect, they are a Christian sect by their own definition, and I'm not going to take issue with that. It's other Christians who take issue with the churches or with the the LDS church's definition of God and of Christianity that allows them to classify them as something outside of your standard Christianity. So um, particularly uh, when it comes to Mormonism, it has oddly enough, th this may sound crazy to hear, but Mormonism has a logical answer to most questions that are left unanswered in Christianity. Interesting. And so let me, uh, let me, let me qualify that. Okay, so we have Christianity of it's the standard idea that uh, God breathed our souls into the the dust, and then from that he formed Adam, and then from Adam he took the rib and made Eve as a helpmate. Um, Mormonism does essentially hold to that, but doesn't think that's the beginning. Mormonism says that's the beginning of life here on Earth, but we are all infinite beings. We are all infinite spirits. And we were born in the premortal existence. And then when we, uh, 
when we decided to follow Jesus's plan of salvation as opposed to Satan's plan of, of robot humans, basically, where there is no free will, but everybody gets to heaven, uh, we decided to go with Jesus's plan. And that, that includes the idea that we have free agency, free will. So we passed through the veil and we lost our connection to the pre-mortal existence. We forgot everything. We come down and we have our mortal existence and then we die and our body separates from us and we our spirit goes to spirit paradise or spirit prison based on who we are and our deeds in our lifetime and we're separated from the body. Then the first resurrection happens and that's when our bodies and our spirits are un- reunited and uh, there are seven successive uh, resurrections that happen based on what your actions were, what your religion was, all of the ordinances and covenants that you made with God in your corporeal form. Uh, and you are t- you come you are resurrected and judged based on what what how good of a person you were, and there's ob- there's a lot more nuance to this. But then essentially there's a thousand year period where Satan is bound and the earth is turned into a paradise and everybody commits all of their life and all of their talents and everything to the gospel of Jesus Christ and they are converted to Mormonism and then after that thousand year probationary period. Satan is loosed and there's this great final battle. And then after that final battle, that's when we are designated to go to the celestial, terrestrial, telestial kingdom. And then, of course, the outer darkness that Satan rules, that Lucifer is has dominion over, they're just kind of appended onto the end. They become Satan's armies during the final battle. Well, so, you do know theology because you're, 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 everything you say I agree with. That's, that's okay. actually LDS theology, yeah. And it goes way, way deeper. This is just scratching the surface of this whole idea and everything. But the point is, is like all of these points represent questions that are posed towards Christianity that most Christianity doesn't have an answer for. Mm -hmm. And then if we dive down into the minutia of each and every one of those positions, every one of those plot points that I I said, the pre-mortal existence, earthly existence, paradise, prison, uh, you know, all of those points, there's even more logical answers in there. The problem with all of that. There's no hell. There's no hell, right? Because I didn't Uh, hear that. Not really. The the, the telestial would be the, there's an outer darkness, but, the, yeah. Even the telestial is supposed to be better than what it is here. But uh, do you ever notice, though, I mean, I, I like the fact that you actually do give valid uh, Mormon theology. Uh, I see a lot of people that, especially when they leave the church, they they fall into that um, mindset where, you know what, anything that goes against the church, I'm going to buy into. And they levy right. stuff against the church that's just not true. I mean, absolutely not true stuff. Yeah. And you, I'm sure you've seen that, right? And especially that when, is- when it comes to beliefs. That was partially the impetus behind starting the podcast because I was listening to atheist podcasts where people would go on and state completely inaccurate things about the church or they would miss a date. They would miss a detail here and there. And I just scream at my headphones. You know, I was driving a truck for a living at the time. I'd scream at the windshield. No, you got it wrong. So that's you know, that was partially of why I wanted to do it as well, because I I feel like I have all the answers. Damn it. Yeah, I everybody to know them. You, <laughs> yeah. you, I, and I don't mean to be like taking over too much here, but since I have somebody here that is, I can kind of. Uh, bounce this off of because I think that you are very well versed in this. Um, Do you agree that the the four scriptures for LDS would be the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Doctrine and Covenants? And when people try to bring in other things like Bruce McConkie's Mormon doctrine, that's not scripture. It was never said to be scripture. He never said it was scripture, even as a disclaimer in there saying these are his writings. Do you find that when people use like Mormon doctrine, uh, the book by McConkie as scripture, or saying that's LDS scripture, do you find that a lot? Because I, I, I see that quite frequently. I'm like, look, that's not scripture. They're, they're not calling it scripture. That's what he believes, and be it right or wrong, but you can't call that Elias scripture if they don't consider it scripture. Yeah, and that's obviously a pretty fine line when you get into the minutia of it, because you have a book by Bruce R. McConkie published in 1953. McConkie was an apostle at the time. He never became a prophet of the church, and you would think any revelation, any scripture has to come from the prophet which is not necessarily always the case. If we look at the Doctrine and Covenants, a number of the revelations never came through Joseph Smith. They were given to somebody else. They were, you know, that, well, there's obviously a lot of nuance to this. And once we get to the official declarations, that came out of uh, Wilford Woodruff. That was uh, the first and second manifesto. And then finally, the declaration giving blacks a priesthood in 1978, that came out of, that came from the prophet. So you can say that anything that comes from the prophet is scripture, but that's not true either because the Journal of Discourses is just a 26 volume lecture series from uh, Brigham Young, from Wilford Woodruff, from uh, William Mines Phelps, from uh, Parley P. Pratt, from all of these major figureheads in Mormonism. And Journal of Discourses is largely disavowed by the church today. 
Although it's um, printed because, by the church. The church says here it all is. This is the history, but this is not scripture. We it's don't not, yeah. This. And I it shouldn't have said disavowed because they yeah. disavow doctrines that are offensive. But let me just say there are a lot of doctrines in the Journal of Discourse that they do disavow, like sure. um, like many lectures by Brigham Young about Adam God doctrine. Adam God doctrine, especially uh, about sure. you know uh, the curse of Cain. If uh, if a person uh, mixes their blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty is death on the spot, and people did suffer the wrath of that. Um, the, the Church doesn't avow a lot of those doctrines that are taught in the Journal of Discourses. Uh, there are a number of other outlets, propaganda. Propaganda outlets, uh, you know, from the the woman's exponent to the enzyme to uh, the the Deseret News, all of these that publish tracks on Mormonism, or they publish um, articles written by apostles and the prophet, but that's never canonized either. So none of these things are canonized; they're all just propaganda. But yeah. scripture, yes, I totally agree. Scripture, you got the the canon, the the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, and Bible, King James Version Bible, of course, not the Joseph Smith translation because we don't talk about that. Um, <laughs> Although it's included, <laughs> I have I have the set, and it's the it's JST was included in one of them. It's just uh, Matthew. It's just Matthew. Uh, yeah, that's, that is true. And yeah, it's, it's not like, even the entire Gospel it's, of Matthew. It's, it's, it's one it, chapter. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted to re, I guess, re, revision it. I guess I don't know. He did. He did. Yeah. He rewrote. He rewrote. Um, I want to say it's like some like three thousand verses out of the Bible. Uh, him and Sidney Rigdon teamed up and, and put it together, and it was uh, is very interesting. The details surrounding that. What's I mean, the um? What what's, what with the with the uh, the Joseph Smith story? I, I kind of want to dive into that a little bit because yeah, I think that's a fascinating aspect of it. Can you kind of walk us through his uh, experience with? God and Jesus and the the thing about these the golden tablets and kind of how that was received at the time and and kind of uh, go into that in just a little bit more detail because I think that's a fabulous uh, aspect of the religion that's just amazing to think of this guy coming to you and saying um, I've got these I've got these golden tablets that Jesus it's gave me. It's an interesting Clark. story. I mean, it yeah, really it is. is. The history I mean, of the LDS is. Church is is just like the Bible. People you know may not agree with it, but there's historicity there that's very fascinating. Oh, well, definitely. Let's hear it. Well, and Mormonism is unique in a way that it's one of the few major world religions, and we can quabble about your definition of major there, but uh, it's one of the, the largest world religions that started within the past two centuries that mm -hmm. we have the court documentation of. We have the land deeds of uh, when these when land was purchased and transferred to and from people in the church. I mean, we have a lot of the documentation, and Joseph Smith even delivered a revelation in 1841 saying that everybody who performs baptisms for the dead needs to make a record of every single baptism they do, which provided an amazing amount of historical uh, documentation that historians are able to pilfer through and construct our historical models with. So uh, one thing about Mormonism is it is so deep and so... I don't know how, I don't know how else to say that. There's, it's so multifaceted that you can dive in any depth. You can get your feet wet or you can dive in completely head first and you will never emerge on the other side. You can spend your entire life studying Mormon history and never get to the bottom of, of anything. Um, and it's just like any other field of history, right? You, you begin as a general historian just studying religious history, 19th century American religious history. And then you, uh, you become more and more uh, uh, targeted in your approach. You, you become a, uh, a Joseph Smith uh, Mormonism historian instead of the entire century of the 19th century. And then you dive into being a specifically a Nauvoo historian and then a Nauvoo Relief Society historian. So there's multifaceted um, levels of history here and people devote their entire lives to understanding Mormonism and they still may not know some of the simplest details of 20th century Utah Mormonism. So mm -hmm. it's really fun that way and that's why I, it's what I've done with Naked Mormonism could truly be an endless endeavor. I mean, it, the, you can dive as deep as you want to go, and it, the the history becomes fractal. The deeper you dive into it, you just get lost in the minutia. But the minutia yeah. is so important to understand the history and context. So, to your point, the first vision account. This is a very interesting facet of Mormon history, and it is something that when a lot of Mormons study this, they often will fall away because there are significant problems in the first vision account. 
Now, what I mean by that is the First Division account, as it's parroted today, the 1820, Joseph Smith was 14 years old. He had just read James 1.5. He goes out to pray in the the, the sacred grove, and um, you know he wrestles with the adversary briefly, and then Jesus and God descend in corporeal form over his head. Um, you know, they're white as lightning and brighter than the noonday sun, and they tell him, Joseph— um, thy sins are forgiven thee the, there are no true religions all their professors are corrupt and then he goes on to meet with the angel Moroni three years later and met, met with angel Moroni every year until 1827 when he receives the gold plates and then he spends from essentially uh, in 1827 once he had the plates he you know he got married to his wife Emma Smith uh, sorry Emma Hale and then he ends up translating with Martin Harris. Martin Harris loses the first 116 pages that they have, the Book of Lehi. And then Oliver Cowdery comes along in 1829, and Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery bust out the entire 516 pages in a matter of basically three months. It's an incredible endeavor, writing a 500-page book in three months. Um, and then April 6, 1830, the Book of Mormon was released to bookshelves and the missionaries headed out and the church was started and it's all amazing it's this amazing story the problem is most of the details of that didn't surface until 1838 and all of and and why i say 1838 uh, that's because that's when the first correlated version of mormon history came about the first whitewashed propagandized version of mormon history began to be printed in uh or began to be uh, documented mm -hmm. in serialized format. The problem with that is that's 18 years after the supposed Sacred Grove account happens. Historians don't like that. 18 right. year discrepancy from when an occasion happened to when it was written down, that's a significant problem. And if you walk back to previous iterations of the First Vision story, there are significant differences. For example, um, at one point in the 1832 account, for example, there is no Sacred Grove account. There is um, Joseph going out into the woods in 1822 when he was 17 years old, and he prayed to God, and he said, The heavens opened, and the Lord said to him that his sins are forgiven thee, walk thy way, and do good, basically. So that doesn't sound like God and Jesus descending in separate corporeal beings. And um, the angel is also unnamed. The angel Moroni is unnamed at this time. Um, and there are just there are multiple differences from the 18... Basically, the 1829 account, which is part of the Doctrine and Covenants, to the 1832 account, which was just a letter that Joseph Smith wrote, to the 1835 and 36 versions that were essentially circulated among the Mormon elites, to the 1838 account that wasn't published until 1842. That's 22 years after it happened that this was actually published, that everybody else in the world saw this account. So you see all of these major discrepancies, and we can we can dig in. Like I said, this is fractal history. We could dig into the minutia of every single one of these, um, and we will bore everybody with them. But um, needless to say, when people know the discrepancies and they understand just how untenable a position is of the 1838 account that was published in 42, it does chase a lot of people away from faith in the church. I yeah, I don't mind I, some minor differences between reiterations of stories. We all we all see that, but you're, you're right. There was there was some major differences. One of the, the the biggest ones is in one of the iterations. It wasn't the first one, but it was when God the Father El Elheim and and the Son Jesus came down and he said, "This is my beloved Son. Hear him." Um, that wasn't in the first one. Like you said, the first one, if I remember correctly, correct. he just heard God's voice, right? Yes, exactly. So that's a, that's a that's not a, that's not a minor detail. No, not at all. And also, the, uh, the angel, the the angel that came down was named Moroni in the 1830s. But somehow, when they got to Nauvoo and began publishing the history, um, that's when it was changed to the angel Nephi. And then a, a subsequent printing in 1856 also named the angel Nephi. And if you have, if you understand the story of Nephi in the Book of Mormon versus the story of Moroni in the Book of Mormon, that the uh, you know the angel Moroni was the final. Um, he was the fire, man, yeah. yeah, he was the he guy who the compiled and, and buried the plates, essentially. You know, he continued the record after his father Mormon passed it down to him. That is tantamount to uh, George R.R. R. Martin saying that Peter Dinklage got his head cut off in the first season of Game of Thrones. Oh, oh that's, that's a huge spoiler. That's a huge. I haven't seen it yet. No, oh, Peter Dinklage oh, did yeah, get his, Peter Dinklage didn't get his head. Uh, that was going to be one of my next questions, too. Um for someone who like like me who doesn't know very much, just what you see in you know in, in society 
I guess an average person would, would know about Mormonism, is what was on the plates and what happened to the plates. Well, for, for first, let, let's clarify, there was more than one set of plates, supposedly. There was actually large plates and there were small plates, and then there was either a smaller okay. plates for, um, well, uh, who, who had, the, who, it was a real small plates they had, too, that was mentioned. But yeah, there, were, there were the small plates, large plates, uh, the plates of brass. And plates then, of brass, yeah. Yeah, the gold plates were the abridged ones, and then the plates of the Jaredites. So five. They had abridged plates. <laughs> yeah, because they when Love it. I, I, they, just to talk about the Book of Mormon itself would take a whole different episode. But then the yeah. and the Neophytes. it took me seven and a half hours to just scratch the yeah, surface on my podcast. Well, it's we're huge. gonna have to try to go through it, you know, kind of quickly because there's a a, a interesting conversation that's going to be had towards the end between you two about um, the the cult issue. I do want to get to that because I think that's an interesting. Um, way to, to yes, it's funny because so far like we could kind of agree on everything. I think. <laughs> oh yeah. But before, <laughs> before we get there, what what was on these plates? Like, what exactly did Reformed they entail, the and then what happened to them? Yeah, reformed Egyptian. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually right now as we speak, I'm putting together a video about the Book of Abraham, and mm -hmm. um, that was something that came out in 1842 that Joseph Smith translated from ancient papyri that he purchased from a dealer named Michael Chandler in 1835. 1842 comes along, he publishes the Book of Abraham, which was supposedly translated from these papyri. To put some context onto this, um, due to the Napoleonic uh, Crusades, not Crusades, uh, conquering of Egypt, uh, Napoleon's troops were able to unearth the Rosetta Stone and a number of other Egyptian antiquities that had been laying dormant for, you know, a thousand or for you know a thousand to fifteen hundred, two thousand years, however long from when the Egyptian Empire was at its height, near around the time of the supposed Jesus story. So, the a number of these these antiquities were unearthed by Napoleon's troops, and that basically kicked off the field of Egyptology. And we have this Rosetta Stone, which is an incredible thing, an incredible discovery, where it has the uh, two iterations of the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian language, and then uh, below it, it has ancient Greek. And ancient Greek in the 1820s or 1800s was well understood, well studied. There were ancient Greek scholars because there were Bible scholars. Egyptian, however, was extremely elusive. And because of this, a number of scholars and historians and archaeologists set about on a um, a major campaign to try and decipher ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs and uh, demotic script so they could understand what was going on in Egypt. And it's because of these scholars in the very early 19th century that we are able to understand so much of Egypt now. They laid the groundwork for modern Egyptology. Mm -hmm. So it took uh, from the the discovery of the Rosetta Stone was 1799. Joseph Smith was born in 1805, you know, a mere six years later. And at that time, there it was understood that there were a lot of Egyptian artifacts and, and, you know, these pieces of antiquity coming out of Egypt and being bandied about America and Europe and being exhibited for fees and being sold to collectors. And a lot of these have been lost to history, unfortunately, which is mm, – that's really frustrating. That really sucks Absolutely. for for the, the study – the field of historical studies. But what that did is it created this – fervor uh, this public interest in ancient Egyptian. So while Francis Champollion uh, was uh, deciphering this, he was kind of on the forefront. Him and a guy named Thomas Young were going back and forth about the best way to decipher ancient Egyptian. Champollion finally publishes um, his uh, basically his Egyptian alphabet, his deciphered Egyptian alphabet in 1824. Joseph Smith comes along, you know, six years later and says, I have gold plates. Uh, well, sorry, you know, three years after that, I have gold plates that are written in reformed Egyptian. And it was a meme. Ancient Egyptian was a meme. So he just picked up on something that was exciting and that people would have um, people would have resonated with, but not known enough about to debunk his claims. And he just ran with it. So he said that these are golden plates, uh, which harkens to his alchemical uh, proclivities. And he says that they were written in a form, reformed Egyptian uh, brought here by Jews that built the civilizations that we see because these Native Americans are nowhere near civilized enough to have actually built all the civilizations we're seeing. Uh, that, that taps into the, the mound builder myths that were prevalent throughout the area. And he, he quote unquote, translated. I don't know how you want to define that, but he translated what was on those gold plates into the Book of Mormon. There are a lot of interpretations of what translated means. There are a lot of questions about where those plates are. Um, 
the plates, uh, it was claimed that the plates were taken back by the angel Moroni, taken back to heaven. We don't know. Um, Brigham Young later claimed that um, Oliver Cowdery had told him of a the Hill Camorra, where they, uh, where Joseph initially extracted the plates, that Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith went into what they called Camorra's cave. And it was just this cave where Moroni had deposited all of the plates. And according to Brigham Young, Oliver Cowdery claimed that there were enough plates there that uh, it would have filled multiple wagon loads of of or just metal plates with uh, writings on them in Reformed Egyptian. So there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of conjecture. Nobody actually knows. And unfortunately, the plates were never examined by anybody who was qualified at the time. So nobody knows. Yeah, it's no plates. A pipe Price, do you think we should back it up a little bit? Because people that may not be familiar with it may not know what the hell we're talking about when it comes to plates. And yeah. kind of maybe kind of explain um, the the Lamanites, the Neophytes, and especially how they they relate to Central America, relating to uh, Guatemala, relating to Yucatan, Chichen Itza, that kind of area. Um, because that's obviously where the Book of Mormon archaeological history would have been from. Now, a lot of people don't realize that that ah. when we're talking about the Book of Mormon, we're talking about Central America. Yeah, uh, that's people one theory. hear that and they just they they they, they don't correlate that. There, so, that's, there, no, well, there's a correlation on, between them and, and Chichen Itza? Yeah. Um, well, okay, well so I, I mean, it depends on how you that. look at it. The Olmecs, the, the Toltecs, the Mayans, the, the Incans, yeah. uh, which which are Peru, all of them stem from different – there was two There was two migrations over from the Old World, according to that's uh, the Book of Mormon. And uh, the, well, the older ones would have been the Olmecs, and the newer ones would have been, I think, the Toltecs and, and further on. But yeah, that the, the, the predecessors to the native people in Central America – wasn't the native Indians. People have this weird narrative that the – Book of Mormon talks about people living the you know leaving the old world, which had been Mesopotamia, coming over to the United States area. No, it was them going to Central America. Ooh, the Chichen needs the connection. Let's so, use this. <laughs> so maybe you might want to explain to them a little bit more on that, Bryce, because I think that kind of confuses people there. So I I have to take issue with a lot of what you said only because it was um, inadequate to explain. So much nuance that I'm exists. Giving the, I'm giving it the wasn't bones on this. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing. It's like what you said. It isn't wrong. It's there's just a lot right. more nuance and conjecture surrounding it. So, in much the way that Napoleon's troops were conducting archaeological digs, and there were archaeological digs going all over in Europe and, and across Asia, uh, the Europeans that came over to America were digging like crazy. They were finding uh, these these major mounds that were everywhere where they were, you know, burial grounds and there were these massive cities and ruins of cities. Well, they didn't understand germ, the, the you know, germ theory and they didn't understand old world sicknesses infecting new world peoples. They didn't understand that um, as as historians have best estimated anywhere from 80 to 95 percent of the uh, Native Americans died from sickness and from, you know, uh, direct extermination efforts, whether that was through war or through deliberate infection or whatever the case may be, when the Europeans came over. So there is a 200, you know, 250 year period there where somewhere between, you know, there, the estimates are all over the place, but somewhere between eight and 30 million people were just wiped off of the, the face of the, the nation. That leaves a lot of cities behind. That leaves a lot of infrastructure, a lot of roads, a lot of hieroglyphs and petroglyphs that are carved into rocks. That leaves a lot of questions unanswered, and it leaves cities in ruin. So when the Europeans came over, all they saw, you know, by and large, were these, for lack of better words, these savage natives who were fighting tooth and nail to try and keep their sacred lands from being taken over by European settlers. And, you know, when you're, when you're fighting off an, in, an invasive species, you're not at your best. The native or the Europeans that came over in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, they never saw the native civilizations the way that the conquistadors did. They never saw the Aztec and the Incan empires. They never saw these massive cities. They never saw the trade routes. They never saw the communication and the calendars. They never saw the mathematics, the rudimentary mathematics that were used. They never saw any of that civilization. The best that they could come up with with, you know, with is the mountain builders myth that some at some point enlightened Europeans or Israelites or fill in the blank, an enlightened race came across – the the, Amer or the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean and settled the area and then these savage Indians killed off the civilized groups. Now, 
the thing is, is like Native American societies were structured quite similar to European societies in that you have, um, you know, more populous urban areas that tend to be, you know, uh, have much more communication, uh, much more, uh, you know, infrastructure and so on and so forth. Then you have kind of the outer lying backcountry areas where the people may not um, have to deal with their next door neighbors that might be, you know, miles away. Right. So. There's there's massive variability of what civilizations in Native America looked like. And the European settlers came over here and they were just imposing or transposing their view of society on the Native American culture with an extremely limited data set. So they started coming up with all kinds of interesting narratives about who it was that built all of these civilizations because it couldn't be these Native Americans. They're far too savage to be able to you know, be this, this ingenious. So Joseph Smith was one among dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, fiction writers that came up with a narrative that said this is where the Natives came from. They were descended of the Israelites. There were multiple migrations and they recounted everything on these plates, and then we're translating from what is on these plates into, um, let's say, Old English Bible-style type of terminology to make it sound like it's Scripture. And that is um, that is where we have the narrative come along that Joseph Smith proposed of the Nephites and the Lamanites being continually at war, the Jaredites coming over in wooden submarines in 2600 BCE. Um, you have uh, all of these interesting things and there's also the major problem of nobody knows where to put the book of mormon down and what i mean by that is the book of mormon creates this narrative and it's a fictional narrative um but a lot of people don't treat it as fiction so they have toiled for centuries or for over a century now of where the book of mormon fits with american archaeology and on their old neck of land that's the, that's the Heartland model, and the Heartland model was espoused by one of Joseph's apostles, William Wines Phelps, um, and, and it was published in the Times and Seasons. That wasn't published by Joseph Smith, but he was an editor at the time, so he probably approved of it going in. Um, but there's also significant problems with that. It does, The archaeology itself doesn't match up. The civilizations that remain, the ruins of the civilizations that remain today don't match up with it. Um, there's also the Heartland model where it's just a few uh, tribes that existed in, you know, Indiana, Illinois, kind of the Heartland of America. And that's where it came from. And then Moroni just had to go, you know, a, a few hundred miles to get to the Hill Cumorah in order to bury the plates. So there are multiple models of where the Book of Mormon uh, happened, but you can't well, the set Hill it down. Would have been in Missouri, right? Hill Cumorah is in New York. New York, yeah, um, I'm sorry, upstate New York. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you're, yeah. you're thinking Zion, the, where Zion. the mm-hmm. Second Coming is happening. That's in Missouri. Yeah. Okay. Where, um, yeah, Zion before was in Missouri. We, before we get into the uh, like the cult aspect of it, um, or yeah. not the cult, but the yeah. Before we get into the the that that talk between you guys, because I'm going to kind of let you two. Um, have that conversation since I think that would be something interesting to have. But before we get into that, I want to kind of touch on the the controversies that you you see in the media sometimes, and kind of a, a that stigma that comes from some people. Um, it, actually, before we do that, let me ask you this: What happened to uh, Joseph Smith? He died. Before before I ask that question, what happened? <laughs> he died. He, he, that was back in the eighteen hundreds, man. I, under, I I understand that, but <laughs> in what in what way he did was he, killed in prison? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to do try and hit on a couple of high points. Um, You know, we're skipping over the tops of these mountains. Uh, There's a lot we could dive into any one of the valleys. But Joseph Smith published the Book of Mormon, New York, 1830. He ended up moving, having the first mass exodus to Ohio. And he set up the church headquarters in Kirtland, Ohio, teamed up with a preacher friend of his named Sidney Rigdon. And they converted all the Mormons there into or all of the Campbellite followers, all the Baptist followers into Mormons. He also set up a a satellite community of Mormons in Missouri. And after a number of significant problems with the Mormons in Ohio, Joseph Smith um, was essentially excommunicated from his own church, along with a number of the Quorum of the Apostles in Kirtland. And he was forced to have a mass exodus to Missouri, where there was a larger congregation of the church out there. And he held a, a purge when he got to Missouri. He excommunicated a number of prominent members who had created the church in Missouri because he thought that the, the church in Missouri was an apostasy and he needed to bring it into line with his own ideas. 
So he spent the year of 1838 in Missouri, which um, a number of factors con- kind of convoluted into this conflict with the Missouri militia because the Missourians didn't like the Mormons by and large because they weren't paying their bills and because they were publishing revelations talking about them going to uh, to take over America by force. So the Missourians and the Mormons went to war, and there was the 1838 Mormon War in Missouri that ended with the deaths of a number of people, um, that ended with a uh, the Hans Mill Massacre, which uh, left um, nearly 20 Mormons dead and buried in a well. Uh, there were a number of, of significant things that happened uh, related to this, and then Joseph Smith, a number of other prominent individuals in the church were arrested for high treason, arson, and robbery. And he was he was facing uh, the gallows and he escaped from prison and made his way up into Illinois, where his saints built the city of Nauvoo. And on the other side of the river, um, the, they called it Zarahemla. And there were a number of uh, names for the area, but they settled on this this tract in in Nauvoo or in Illinois and Iowa, right on the Mississippi. And they basically created a town out of nothing in this swampland. Um, 1844 comes along. Joseph Smith has, uh, you know, upwards of anywhere from 30 to 40 wives. Uh, some historians have hedged guesses in, you know, up in the 60s and 70s as far as his number of wives. Um, but historical consensus says about 33 wives. He had that many wives. He was um, he had his council of 50, which was his uh, basically his uh, council of the theocracy that he was building. He was constructing in Nauvoo. And he was also running for president of the United States in 1844. And he was arrested for burning down a printing press uh, because the printing press published the Nauvoo Expositor, which revealed some of Joseph's more nefarious practices, such as polygamy. He was taken to jail in Carthage. He turned himself in, actually. There were some and, fraud accusations, too, though, right? I mean, some money fraud yeah. accusations. Yeah, and that's that's one aspect of this that often isn't discussed is Joseph – for most of his career, he was printing fake money, or him and his cronies were printing fake money, known as bogus, uh, bogus and counterfeit everything. money. <laughs> yeah, and and in you know in Kirtland, they even created what they, what they called the Kirtland Safety Society, but they couldn't get a banking charter for it, so they called it the Kirtland Safety Society Anti Banking Company. You can still buy those banknotes that have Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon's signature on them; they're a collector's item now. Um, wow. but a lot of Mormons lost thousands and thousands of dollars. And that was one of the main reasons that they excommunicated him and kicked him out of Kirtland. He had to flee in the middle of the night in 1838 because they were, they were going to kill him. So, uh, finally, 1844, he's running for president. He burns down this printing press. He turns himself in and to the, the jail at Carthage and he was assassinated by an angry mob. I think it was long overdue given his actions. He was a tyrant. He was a dictator. Um, he was influencing politics as well as being a prophet of, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15, possibly 20,000 people. And then after his death, he didn't leave any proper succession narrative or who should take the rightful throne. So what I call the schism grenade went off and factions of Mormonism broke off in all different directions. Brigham Young took about half the Mormons out to the Great Basin in Utah. Uh, James Strang took m- the majority of the other half up to Wisconsin. And a number of other small sects kind of broke off off of that. Well, they wanted his son, didn't they? Didn't they? That was the, the reorganization. So in yeah. 1861, I want to say, that's when Joseph Smith III basically catalyzed the reorganization and brought a bunch of these, these, um, these kind of schismatic sects all into one cohesive body. And that yeah. became the RLDS, uh, which turned into the Community of Christ, and the RLDS and the LDS, the Brighamite LDS Church in Utah, have definitely had a bit of a conflicted history, um, particularly um, leading up to about the 1980s before they converted into the Community of Christ. What they're they're on about, much more amicable it, terms now. What does it say about um, a a a congregation of, of of people that are willing to excommunicate the person that has had direct conversations with angels and jesus and god themselves. well they think they let they you know think they fell away they, they realize people are, are fallible and even a prophet but, that you know had direct communion with god can can 
default yeah, but way. My, my point is with with God being uh, with God knowing everything and knowing how how things are going to turn out, you would think He would choose somebody that would go kind of a a different route than uh, <laughs> Joseph Free Smith. Free will, I guess. Free yeah, will. no, that that makes sense. But this is religion; it's not supposed to make sense, right? Of course not. Yes, it's yeah. just that it's it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> well, and, okay. and and it's not necessarily rhetorical because I want to dive into this a little bit because there are a number of times when schisms happened during Joseph's time. From members of his apostles, you know, these trusted elites who claimed at a time that, hey, we actually have the one true religion. Um, Joseph Smith is in apostasy. He needs to acknowledge us as a modern day prophet. And they try to take a number of followers with them. There's, of course, Warren Parrish is a great example. But one of the earliest times that this happened was Hiram Page, one of the witnesses of the gold plates that printed his statements printed in every single copy of the Book of Mormon since it was printed in 1830. Hiram Page uh, during the first year of the church, came along and said, I have revelation. I've been using my seer stone, just like Joseph was using his seer stone. A uh, little treat for the listeners, a little uh, seer stone. You can't see it very well, but it's it's the same kind of rock that Joseph's seer stone is, if anyone's seen pictures of that. Uh, so Hiram Page had this little black stone that he was using in his hat or whatever capacity in order to bring his own revelations. Joseph Smith understood that uh, Hiram Page was claiming to be a prophet, and Joseph committed his revelations to the flames and commanded that his seer stone be crushed into dust and scattered in the wind. So that's just one microcosm. They were really competitive back then. But, uh, but, Extremely. You know, that, but that's not just them. The, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, oh, yeah. the Methodists, oh, yeah. Lutheran, oh, the Methodists, Lutheran. They're all, they're all vying for, for position back those yeah. times. So it's not that exactly. unusual for, for a congregation to have individual members step up and go, hey, you know what? I'm going to be the charge here. I mean, in fact, we see it happen all the time nowadays. It's, yeah, still going on. I was getting yeah, ready to say that. Cha- right? Times don't change. History repeats itself. And the thing is, too, is charisma isn't a sustainable business model. So Brigham Young comes along. He is a businessman. He streamlines all the processes. He sets out this system where you either conform or you die. Joseph Smith wasn't that way. Joseph Smith led with his charisma. But the problem with a charismatic leader is as soon as somebody comes along – that's more charismatic, all the people that were following you because you're charismatic suddenly see somebody else who is more charismatic. They're going to fall. They're going to leave. They're going to leave your congregation. They're going to start attending that preacher and giving him their time. Young was a lot more uh, aggressive to say the least. Calculated. Yeah. Uh, And he was calculated. Oh, that's a good word. Yeah. Yeah, He, he planned. He was not a, he was not a dumb person. No, he was, he was absolutely brilliant. And we could dive, dive into a little bit of the minutia of Brigham Young. Um, but he's, I am extremely astonished with how well Brigham Young was able to make something out of nothing, to create businesses, to force, to just brute force a community into existence in a desert wasteland that nobody wanted to settle. I mean, a great beard, too. A gray beard. Oh, super envious. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, let's talk about there, there are two controversial aspects of, of Mormonism that I want to touch on and just that, two, just well yeah. two main two main ones um, and then I, I think this will kind of branch us off into a, a deeper conversation but the, the two that I want to kind of focus on are the uh, the, the racism aspect and the um, baptizing people Dead. after they die aspect you know those are two extremely controversial. Um, as, so can you kind of talk to both of those points and how they got their origins and, and how they now can square, especially the racism part, you know, they, they can account for that now, but that wasn't the case. Well, can I, can I, can I do that first actually? Please well, do. Let him, yeah. He's the, he's, he's the guest. Let him jump in. I've been monopolizing. I want to hear your take on it first. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you want to go first, go ahead. It, it, I, I just doesn't, thought it doesn't matter. Well, the reason I wanted to go first because I, I, I I'm deferring to his expertise in this. He clearly has researched these topics, and so I'm I sure. want to give my opinion out to see if he agrees or not. Sure. Um, because uh, I think back then racism did exist, uh, no question. I don't find that it, it, specifically most of the leaders in the LDS were racist. I do agree that they they probably had some kind of racist tendencies only because that was the normative. But but back then, there's the the priesthood itself. They said that black people could not get, which is not necessarily true. The ironic priesthood they could, and uh, Joseph Smith did bestow, supposedly again, the priesthood on one of his, of his parishioners who was black. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. but Elijah Abel. It, Elijah Abel, thank you. 
Um, but he, but he, he did give the priesthood to somebody. Um, that's not something that somebody would have done if he was racist, because that led to a lot of controversy. So why would somebody who was racist do that? I now again, I, I don't think there was any it's systemic or institutional racism, but the times being back then were racist because of the times. That's just the way I look at it. How do you feel on that? Interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna just echo that. Um, I think there's an important distinction to be made that people can be not inherently racist themselves, but be part of an institutionalized racism. And that is what Mormonism was and still is to this day. I will argue that until the day I die, until they remove certain passages from the Book of Mormon, the Mormon religion will still be an incredibly racist institution. So, so I differ on that, but I, I know what you're saying. You're talking about the pure white, the the lo, the, the 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 lovely white stuff like that. Like those kind of narratives, especially from that? the original version. Well, the Book of Mormon has been has him had revisions. Yeah, um sure. and, and and so we're going. I'm going to go back to the original original version, which I know you've read. I've read the Book of Mormon three times. Don't remember much from it, but I did read it. Um, so if you're using that because of the language they use, then I would have to agree with you. Those were racist language, but I don't think that made the church racist itself. But I think it's a very nuanced discussion. And I think, you know, I can understand people seeing it any other way. But since I would think you would agree, the people in the church, I don't see any racism at all with the people. What did that book say? Like, what, what's, the, what's the line? What's the, well, what's it the depends first? on where you're from, I guess, because I, I'm from L.A. area. I'm from right, um, right. That, That's so, California it, Mormonism. That's yeah, a California lot Mormonism. I didn't see. Well, I lived in Utah too. Actually, I lived in St. George. And I lived in, in um, Bremerton, and I lived in um, Huntington. Um, okay. I didn't see any racism there, but I saw other things, but uh, nepotism and stuff like that, and just. Um, uh, well, and that's the what thing to like, say about the, the skin color, Steve, that you were talking about. What's the actual verse that it says about or what's it talking about when you say the fair, um, the fair, pure white? fair and delightful? Um, is that what it fair, is? Yeah. So it, it the original passage was white Lightsome. and delightsome. Um, yeah. However, it, it has been changed to fair and delightsome. So that's only one instance. And I believe that's second Nephi chapter five, verse one, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm just pulling that off the top of my head. I, could I, don't, be I, don't, go by, I don't go by passages. It's just like a Bible. Yeah. I know what's in there. Um, Right, it's in there. You can find anything you want. I don't want, I don't want to waste my brain power memorizing the, the, where to find in a scripture. I know it's in there. If I need to get it, I can go find it. That's the sad. only reason that I have that on my mind is because if I am ever approached by missionaries on the street, I'm like, oh, hey, let's let's talk about the Book of Mormon, right? Yeah, uh, I just want to be able to pull that one right out there and, and talk yeah. about it because I think it's interesting. But um, I, let me let me drill in a little bit on on something you said. Uh, you didn't see any racism. That doesn't mean that the racism didn't exist. And much in what we were talking about with early, earlier institutionalized racism, individual actors within a system can be not racist while the institution itself is racist. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that one passage out of Second Nephi that talks about um, the Lord giving the curse of Cain to somebody and making their skin dark and loathsome so that they will not be enticing to my more fair and delightsome people. Wow. That's, it's not just that passage. It's also in the Book of Moses. It's also in the Book of Abraham. There are a number of passages throughout the Book of Mormon, uh, throughout the, the Mormon canon, that are viciously racist. And oh. that is still a doctrine that is understood and accepted as scripture. And it's not just <sighs> the single passages and the verbiage that is used in those, it's the idea of the savage Native Americans that were the Lamanites, those were right. the dark and loathsome Lamanites. Their, their Nephite brethren were the white and delightsome Nephites. The savage, dark-skinned Native Americans killed off the civilized, white-skinned Natives. Yeah, but like you and, said, like you're pointing out, though, the, 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 when they're talking about the dark skin, they're not talking about blacks. They're talking about Native steel. Americans. Steel, that's oh, steel. Oh, yeah, no, no. I mean, what he's saying is absolutely true. What, it what took Brigham Young. True. It took Brigham Young but, to apply that to blacks, yes. specifically, to African Americans specifically. Because of the mark of Cain. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. How do you square that but, today? Like, but how the is thing that, is, well, like I it's, said, not, it's, it's, it's not that it needs to be squared today. Yeah, I was going to say the same it's thing. It's still, really it's there. It is still understood oh. that that is a teaching, even if it's something that it's ignored. That's so, crazy. And also, there's there's a gradient too, because you have the dark skin Lamanites and the white skin Nephites, the you know the evil and the righteous juxtaposed to each other. There's an entire gradient. So as the Lamanites, there's multiple times throughout the Book of Mormon, as the Lamanites began becoming more righteous, their skin started to turn lighter. Right. 
And it's insane that and it's also eugenics. Um, and yeah, this is absolutely. also something um, more recently in the church. Uh, this was a program that was started in, I want to say, 1959. So this is uh, this is basically at the start of the civil. Well, you know, partway through the beginning of the civil rights movement. And we have the church beginning what's known as the Indian placement program. And this is something that was disbanded in, I want to say, like the, the late 1990s. But what it did is it took Native American children off of reservations and put them into Mormon households where they would learn to be good Christians, learn to be good Mormons. And there are multiple quotes from Spencer W. Kimball and from numerous other prophets and apostles who said, I would go to the Hog or go to these these homes where the Native American or the Indian placement program was being taught and, and employed, and I would see the skin of these children sitting next to their parents, their skin was turning whiter because they were living the law of God. And even, I mean, Spencer W. Kimball, who was the prophet when they gave blacks a priesthood, said that um, I would see a child who grew up in the same Hogan, who was exposed to the same sunlight, who was, uh, did all the same activities as their parents, sitting next to their parents, and they were whiter than their parents because they were more righteous i'm yeah, paraphrasing no, I, 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 I agree with you i know what you're referring to i, I think i crazy. use the term racist maybe a little bit different i think i think it's a language thing um i agree with everything you've just said by the way but i i what i don't see have seen is when you have something like okay here's a white person here's a black person in the church they're thinking that the black person is a lesser person i have never seen that ever and, and i guess what what would you define as lesser person because you don't yeah. have to it you don't have to actively say you are a lesser and, and person that might, and that might be true that, that would be an yeah. institutional type thing and, and that, also that, right that might be the case but in my experience in the words that i went to nobody gave a crap if somebody was black or white and that's that, not my and experience that's probably right? and, and and like i said that's that seems like now the, the asians that, nobody liked the asians well, right no yeah, no, 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 thank you. I'm kidding. I love, I love Asians. I learned something, by the way. They're not Orientals. Don't call them Orientals. Rugs are Oriental. Pottery is Oriental. Never refer to a person as Oriental. I, I, I learned my lesson on that. So I love Asians, though. <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> the more you know. Yeah, right. The more exactly. you know. We're, we're not just fun and satire. We actually have educational things here, too, occasionally. <laughs> I'm fascinated. I, 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 um, I think this... Like uh, I'd like to have you. I'd like to have you back sometime to, to go oh, into yes. to, your breadth of knowledge is remarkable. Absolutely. I got to tell you, I'm I'm yeah, I am you. very impressed because I don't even remember the names as eloquently as you do. I I remember the stories. That's why when you say something, I'm like, okay, I do know what you're referring to, and I think you're spot on. But I couldn't prattle them off like you have the top of your head. That's I have, impressive. I have learned more about Mormonism tonight than I ever learned in the <laughs> and you were the two, the two years <laughs> I learned. Can I they hear spent, him? I spent. Yeah. In okay. the in the uh, in the church, so our producer's talking. Yeah, yeah you, I am. It, it, you're a Mormon. I was a Mormon. So, yeah. Well, no, I, see, I mean, you know what's funny is I I know these things and I looked into it when people say, well, Steve, you you know, you didn't really do much research on the LDS Church. Well, I know everything he's talking about, not to his in depth, but I'm familiar with this, and he hasn't told me anything that's new. So I I have looked into this in the past. Yes. Well, and that's the thing is like there's so much nuance built into every topic. Like, I mean, we we talked about that multiple times tonight. It's like so superficial right here. Yeah. yeah this. No I mean, we are walking into the room and trying to look at it. And we're walking into a dark room and shining a laser pointer around trying to figure out what's going on. Right. This is this is such a limited purview of what everything is that is Mormonism. And this is what happens when you spend every waking moment living, eating and breathing Mormonism and Mormon history like uh, it's it is something like the reason I preface this conversation with a uh, discussion or you know voicing that Mormonism is so incredibly fascinating and deep is because it's just that the longer you spend looking into Mormonism, the more you realize how deep it is. And like I I acknowledge Mormonism is an extremely small pool, right? Uh, you're talking about at very best propagandized estimates. You're talking about 15 million people on the planet out of 7 billion that believe in Mormonism that, that hold to that call themselves Mormon. And those, those estimates even are extremely um, flawed in my opinion. This is a small pond, but there are some really big fish swimming around in this pond. And the deeper you dive into this, you realize that it's bottomless. You can spend your whole life exploring nooks and crannies in this pond and you will never get to the bottom. 
And it is so wonderfully fascinating. And what I guess what disturbs me the most about this is I don't believe in the church, but I love studying it. I call myself secular Mormonism because I'm a uh, secular Mormon because I'm a product of the culture. I grew up in it. I'm a, I, I am the way I am because of Mormonism, but I don't believe in it. I don't practice it. I don't do anything that would consider me Mormon. And I make a podcast that is called anti-Mormon by a lot of Mormons, right? For somebody who believes in Mormonism, who thinks that knowing everything about Mormonism is the only way to get to heaven, to get your own planet, to get your polygamous wife, to populate that planet with spirit babies, for someone who truly believes Mormonism is the one true religion, why wouldn't you be interested in this? Why wouldn't you want to know everything there is to know about the church? I cannot, I, my mind cannot wrap around this discrepancy. And, and so often when I talk with Mormons, uh, you know, ex-Mormons, we have fun conversations about, you know, Mormonism and Mormon history and deeper doctrine. But when I'm talking to Mormons, particularly family members, they know that there's no other conversation that I want to have on the planet other than Mormonism and Mormon history. And they yeah. can't get into that conversation because they know they're going to learn some anti-Mormon lies and they're taught to fear that information. So yeah. the thing is, like, for someone who grew up Mormon, for people who have never been Mormon, who don't have a family member or coworker as Mormon, Mormon history is fun. It is exciting and the rabbit holes are absolutely endless. And I encourage people to look into it. Pick up Rough Stone Rolling by Richard Bushman. Pick up Grant Palmer's An Insider View of Mormon Origins or Fawn Brody's No Man Knows My History. Some of those seminal historiographies. Pick them up, just read it, and it's gonna blow your mind. I promise. There is something in there that will blow your mind. I'm a lot more. I'm a lot. Uh, this has been more fascinating than, than you know than I thought the the history part would be. And I, I, we, I, we we're gonna kind of focus on um, more specifically originally you and and how you you know your kind of thing. But it branched off into this talk, which I think is is fascinating. And before we get to the big question of the night, which is, would you consider Mormonism a cult? I just want to kind of touch on the um, the post uh, the post death baptizing and the where that kind of came from and why that's a thing and it why that's still happening today. Yeah, uh, Steve, do you want to touch on that uh, um, before I jump? Uh, in? Just the, the baptism of the dead is just because they believe that uh, everybody needs to be baptized to enter the highest kingdom, which would be the celestial kingdom. And so um, there's certain sanctification processes and endowment processes that need to be taken care of. And they believe that even after death, uh, the spirits can can accept the 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 message of Christ and um, Joseph Smith being a prophet and that you still need to be baptized at some point. So they're trying to get all that done before that dispensational period that he has spoken about where there's 7,000 years of peace, uh, or excuse me, and then Satan, Satan is let loose for a little while and that, that whole narrative there. But they believe that you, you can be baptized, but in the name. Now, I never had a really big problem with it until recently when, um, because they want to baptize certain groups like, like Jews and things of that nature, I can see how that could be offensive to oh, yeah. the family. And so I get yeah. that right now. I do understand that. Um, cause I mean, I understand it's an inert thing for all practical purposes. It's not really hurting anybody, but I can definitely see how families can take offense to that. I get that. Yeah. So, um, I can touch on the Genesis of it if you'd like, or we can just talk about the doctrine. Uh, where do you want me to go with this? Uh, the Genesis is fine. I, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think that's fascinating. So in 1840, um, I, I may be mixing up my date. It might be 41, but I'm pretty sure it's uh, 1840. Uh, Joseph Smith, uh, the founding prophet of Mormonism, his father died. His father, Joseph Smith Sr. I call him in the podcast, I call him Big Daddy Cheese because there's so many <laughs> names in Mormonism. You have to give them nicknames so that people can can remember the right person because you, you lose sight of it. You have to have some way to connect with and create a model of these people in your mind. So Big Daddy Cheese passes away and I, I want to say it's September of 1840. At this time, Joseph's older brother named Alvin Smith. Alvin Smith had died back in 1823. Now, that's seven years before the church had, had begun. But Joseph had created his theology and this system where there's these three degrees of heaven and there's outer darkness. And he needed to create a loophole, basically, for people who had died before they heard about Mormonism to be able to get to the celestial kingdom. So in September of 1840, around this time that Joseph's father, you know, Big Daddy Cheese, is sitting on his deathbed. 
Joseph has a vision of his older brother, Alvin, who is sitting up on the throne with God and Jesus. So he sees his older brother up in the celestial kingdom, his older brother that died, you know, seven years before any of these saving ordinances existed. And the question inevitably arises, well, you know, Alvin was never baptized. He never went through the temple and took out endowments. He never practiced a number of the things that you have told us are absolutely necessary to get to the celestial kingdom. How did he get there? Joseph decides to come up with or appropriate some other previous teachings of baptisms for the dead, where you have to, somebody in bodily form on earth has to practice certain ordinances on your behalf or for yourself in order to get to a kingdom in heaven. So Alvin Smith dies. Joseph says, we need a way in order for people to, who have never heard the gospel to get to the celestial kingdom. And he comes up with baptisms for the dead. Baptisms back then were treated a bit differently than they're practiced now, especially under Brigham Young's rule. There were these cleansing baptisms where somebody who had sinned to a certain extent, they could get baptized again and they would be their sins would be washed away. That's how it's taught in the church today. But it's not seen as like this the way that it was seen in the 1840s, where if you just sin a whole bunch, you can just get baptized and those sins are washed away. Mormons say you get baptized once you have a gift of the Holy Ghost given to you. That is that is it. You, now you believe in it. Every time you get baptized after this, you are getting baptized for dead people. So all of these ordinances need to be practiced in bodily form while on earth. And it's at the genesis of this baptisms for the dead that Joseph delivers his revelation. I want to say it's Doctrine and Covenants 128. I could be wrong on that. Uh, it's in the 120s where he says that everybody needs to document all of the people that they're baptizing. Because as soon as he revealed the doctrine and, and preached on it in, I want to say, January 1841, turns out a whole bunch of people just started going down to the Mississippi and baptizing all of their friends, all of their family, all of their dead loved ones, everybody that they knew. And nobody was taking any record of it. So nobody knew if people were getting baptized four or three or four or five times, like, you know, Hitler's been baptized like eight times or something. Um, people didn't what? know who who has and hasn't been baptized. That's probably anti-Mormon rhetoric. I, I've never verified that. I don't know if there's a way to verify that. But um, yeah, so oh, just man. by the way, any prominent figure in history, you can almost guarantee they've been baptized whether they've been a great inventor, a uh, great theologian, or a great dictator. And great, of course, is being used awfully loosely in this terminology. Sure. Um, That's wild. That is yeah. wild. So, and oh, something else, um, one more fractal to this uh, historical narrative in the baptism sure. for the dead. So Joseph gave this revelation. Everybody has to document everything that they, that all the baptisms they're doing. They were still, at this time, they were building Nauvoo out of a swampland. They had drained that swamp area and they were... They were manufacturing a city where there was nothing there before. There were a couple of houses. That was it. So they were building the Nauvoo Temple, which wasn't completed until after Joseph's death, unfortunately. But Joseph held the baptisms for the dead hostage until they built the temple. So he delivered a revelation after he commanded everybody needs to be baptized. And the way that we baptize for our dead loved ones is by doing necromantic spells. He said, we can't do any more of these until you complete the Nauvoo Temple. And it was never completed in his lifetime. Wow. Well, I still think it's weird that there's some Christians yeah. out there that um, with all the stuff they believe, and then they, they draw the line of baptism for the dead, though. Good At point. that point, it's too much. It's like, yeah. are you really? Because, I, mean, yeah. I, I mean, I agree. That's the, that's the story and how it came about and all that. But is the concept really that bizarre compared to everything else that's in theology? It's necromancy, right? Like Jesus practiced yeah. necromancy, raised Lazarus from the dead. I mean, Joseph Smith practiced. It's not even necromancy. Well, I don't think it's necromancy. Necromancy, you have to actually bring back for the dead. You're just baptizing in their name. But I can, but I can see. But yeah, I mean, it is spells relating to dead people. I, 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 I'm I using a broad that, definition sure. of necromancy. Very, very broad. Yeah. But there, but but my 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 point being is they're willing to to talk about people coming back from the dead, but not. Baptism from a the whole dead. city came back from the dead after, uh, <laughs> yeah, the yeah, you know, yeah, right? they walked out of the graves and walked around that, that they can believe, but the whole let's baptize somebody in their name, which anybody can go do, by the way, you just have to have the priesthood according to them, but it, there's nothing that there's no spirit that actually comes down or anything. You literally are just wild. baptized, and it's somebody's okay. name that you're being baptized for. That's all, yeah. So, um, but before we started the before we started the um, the show, we were talking back, um. Behind the scenes, I guess you would say, even though there's no really behind the scenes before air. Um, it got brought up that, that would you consider Mormonism a cult? And um, 
before we had this conversation, I looked up um, online what the it's, it's kind of like a, a cult checklist, like the things that it would kind of have to check off to be considered a a, a cult. And um, some of the things are questioning doubt and dissent or discouraged um, mind altering practices. The leadership dictates uh, the group is elitist, claiming a special exalted status. The group has a polarized us versus them mentality. The leader is not accountable to any authorities. The group teaches or implies that it's supposedly exalted. Um, and then the group is preoccupied in certain cases with making money. And members are expected to devote an order amount of time to the group and group related activities. So um, it's interesting that you two agree on almost everything up until this point where it it should not be considered a cult and i guess i'll start with steve why would you not consider well i think i think we're going to get into a definitional thing here um because oh, of course too, oh. seriously why did I um, and it's probably the only reason oh, why we disagree no. on this you have you have to you have to you have to look at the word cult in different ways um there are various different checklists you've named off one there's also the, the uh, there's another book called the cult of the, uh um called what's the the big book on cults um but there's there's different ways to look at cults now in the broadest spectrum, all religions are cults. Sure. And really, it, I think it meant something along the lines of formal venerable worship. So in that regard, a, a religious organization is a cult. But if we use that if we use that word for that kind of thing, that any religious organization has a leader, then Catholics are a cult. Um, you know, anybody that had, that has donations is a cult. I think it's too vague. When I, I think of a, a cult – yeah, and I get that. I get that. But when I think when I use the word cult, I'm very think specifically thinking of Heaven's Gate, uh, Jim Jones, those kind of things. Um, those are to me are the the archetype of what a cult would be. It takes everything that he just he just had and it takes it to the archetype level. That's when I say that is a cult. Now there are some other situations where I think that even some more modern stream religions may be considered cultish. Um, I'm not a fan of Jehovah's Witness. Um, I. I May may I'll take arguments that's a cult, but for the most part, I I don't think that organizations just by throwing out the pejorative as a cult because it to me applies ubiquitously and 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 you and I agree he and I agree that the people in the church are some of the nicest people you ever want to meet. I have sure. I I I, th I have the, the most love for the Mormon people. They're just yeah. very very nice people. Sure they're my friends and family. Were nice too, though. I absolutely so love Mormons. Gates were, were yeah, nice. and Mormon Mormon chicks. Mormon girls oh, okay. are hot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bryce, uh, I had to throw that out there. Mormon girls, come on, admit it. Mormon girls are very attractive. There's, uh, there's, it's probably because I was bred in the culture that I certain, I see certain, um, physical attributes that make me say, that is, that looks like a proper mate to bring <laughs> party <laughs> strong <laughs> offspring. She has she nice and fine children. And skin. <laughs> Yeah. Um, OK, so so, Kyle, I want to um, take issue with uh, one point in your definition. You said it's about there. there's something about money. Do you mind re reading that for yeah, me sure. if you can pull it up again? Because sure. um, th that's that's one issue that I take with a lot of this. It said that the uh, the group is uh, preoccupied with making money. OK, so that is not what I take or not um, one of the criteria that I use to define cult. And mm -hmm. what I am using is is Stephen Hassan's bite model, and this is from Freedom of Mind, and this is just the psychological aspects of that, sure. of of what it means to be cult mind control. And and Steve, I'm going to try my best to convince you, and hopefully by the end of my definition and the criteria that I'm about to set out, we'll be able to come to an agreement that we can define the church or certain aspects of it that s seem to strike similar tendencies to what we would define as a cult. I would agree with you. Heaven's Gate, Jim Jones, Don't Sound, yeah, sure, th those are cults, right? But cult is something very specific, and there is the popular psychology or popular psychology definition of what it means to be cult. So, Steve Hassan, in his book Freedom of Mind, constructed what's known as the bite model, and this has become the standard bearer for defining what is and is not a cult. Bite model is behavior, information, thought, and emotion. These four aspects. And there are there are subcategories within each of these or sub definitions within each of these. And if any group you are a part of happens to check these boxes or check a certain number of these boxes, it becomes higher probability or higher on the scale of probability that it is a cult at some level. Now, this is an important definition because, Steve, you define um, Heaven's Gate and Jim Jones, uh, Jonestown. Those are cults. That is the popular definition of cult. 
right. that is the the blood oath suicide cult with whatever wackadoodle you know hundreds of people killing themselves that's disturbing that is what the popular media would call a cult they're the, but they're a the cult, archetype yeah that is the well, not even the archetype well, I mean, it is it is i would call it just one metric it is one point on a metric of what we would consider a cult so go ahead See, steve i was gonna say I, I break them more down like you have terrorist cults you have racist cults you have polygamous cults you have a destructive cults, you got doomsday cults you have all different types Flat of Earth cults, cults out there Flat Earth cults. You have all different types of cults out there. And um, Steve, hang on. I have to stop you because now you're using the word cult to brand anything that is perceived bad by some people as cult. Right. And no, I don't I, agree I, I, because I not all cults are negative. Not all cults are bad. You have cult of personality. Um, yeah. Right? I, I, right. I, 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 I know you're going to be talking about the psychological stuff. Um, it's just weird because I, I think that what you're going to be telling me is pretty much applicable to any religion. Ah, huh, it's interesting you say that. Yeah. So, uh, so do you think that? Yeah. Wait. So, so do you think that all religions are cults? Yes. No, I do not. Um, okay, Kyle so, says yes. You say no. Now you guys argue. Go for it. I I do think it. I mean, I, that's just my personal opinion. I, I think that anything that tries to indoctrinate or brain or you know brainwash you is. But I that's just me. Yeah. Well, no, I think and, we all use these words you know differently, and I I don't think there's a right or wrong answer in some of this stuff. It's how you use these these words. I don't use the word cult for certain things. Mormonism to me is not a cult, and you could try to convince me, sure, but um, I think you can have a huge upset battle because I've done this for years. Uh, people say it's a cult, but you know what? We have people that are Christian theologists that think Mormon is a cult, but they don't think their religion is a cult. Well, if you apply the same metrics, you you, you know then you're going to get the same results. But their metric is, oh well, we have classical theism, and the classical theism can't be a cult. Cult. Right. So um, let me Kyle speak to Kyle first. Let me speak to Kyle first because I I agree with you that um, – well, you say that y you would consider all religions a cult. I don't quite agree with that. I just sure. happen to think that the vast, vast majority of religions happen to strike a lot of cult tendencies. That's fair. And, and at what point you consider cult tendencies has become definitionally a cult is largely a battle of semantics, right? If sure. something strikes cult tendencies, it doesn't necessarily mean it as a cult. It just means that it, it seems there it, it employs some of the same psychological control mechanisms that cults do. Cult so now – Cultish. Yeah, cultish. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's cult-esque. Cult -esque. Cult -esque. Oh, I like yeah. that better. Oh, is that the fancy version? I like that better. Yes. Yeah. No, that's so fair. Now, I think that's, that's, that's a, fair, uh, a fair point. So sure. let me speak to you, Steve. Now, um, you said you've been doing this for a long time. I, I have to invoke a logical fallacy. That's that's an argument from authority. Um, just because I, I haven't been doing this for very long, you have been doing this for a long time, that shouldn't unequivocally make it so I should have a hard time convincing you of something. No, I Let's, didn't mean like I just, that. I, I'm just I, I going to— It's not a fallacy because what I meant was I've had a lot of people try. None has succeeded before, and they've used similar things. That's all. Okay, okay, cool. I, I'm glad we can come to I you. avoid fallacies at all costs, trust me. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't. what yeah, I'm you don't to care do about is fallacy fine fallacy fallacies make life fun to be honest. So, um, this, what I'm going to present to you, let's, let's evaluate the merits of this claim in trying to apply Mormonism to Steve Hassan's bite model and see if by the end of this, if Mormonism tends to strike tendencies within the, this cult bite model, um, at the end of it, let's see if you, redefine your understanding of the word cult to include Mormonism and the majority of religions the way that Kyle and I have. So let me first define what Stephen Hassan says on freedomofmind.com about the way that definite cults are defined. This is kind of a long reading. Uh, please bear with me as I go through this. Sure. Many people think of mind control as an ambiguous, mystical process that cannot be defined in concrete terms. In reality, mind control refers to a specific set of methods and techniques, such as hypnosis or thought-stopping, that influence how a person thinks, feels, and acts. Like many bodies of knowledge, it is not inherently good or evil. And I think this is where there, there may be a breakdown in, in your definition of what a cult is, Steve, because it sounds like you're trying to apply... Um, uh, evil and maliciousness to the word cults, but there, there are good cults out there and we'll sure. get into that in just a second. If mind control techniques are used to empower an individual to have more choice and authority for his or her life remains within their selves, the effects can be beneficial. For example, benevolent mind control can be used to help people quit smoking without affecting any other behavior. That's a good cult. If a system causes you to quit smoking, that's going to be beneficial for your health, even if it uses cult mind control in order to do that. That's good. 
Mind control becomes destructive when the foc- when the locus of control is external and it is used to undermine a person's ability to think and act independently. Now Hassan st- speaks to destructive cults. As employed by the most destructive cults, mind control seeks nothing less than to disrupt an individual's authentic identity and reconstruct it in the image of the cult leader or the gospel, one might say. I developed the bite model to help people determine whether or not a group is practicing destructive mind control. The bite model helps people understand how cults suppress individual members' uniqueness and creativity. Bite stands for the cult's control of an individual's behavior, thought, intellect, and emotions. Um, So now that constructs uh, what the bite model is, right? And what these mind control tendencies are. And mind control isn't you know, the, the government using LSD in the, the water system to make it so that you're, you're fluoride or whatever in the, the water system to make it so that you're a mindless zombie. Mind control is a very set uh, pieces of um, a culture that cause you to change your thinking in some way. That can be good or bad, as Stephen Hassan says. So let's go through a couple of the behavior controls. I'm, um, he lists 19 in that. Um, he lists six in information uh, 10 of them in thought control and eight of them in emotional control. And there are subclasses to each one of these. I'm not going to read through all of them. I'm just going to read a few of them and let me see if, um, if Steve, if you think that Mormonism falls within the purview of what would be considered, um, cult mind control. So we have under behavior, we have regulate an individual's physical reality, um, causing them to go to church every Sunday, dictate where, how, and with whom the member lives and associates or isolates, anti-Mormon literature, when, how, and with whom the member has sex, obviously, only missionary position, only the opposite sex. We can't have any of you you boys Wait, having missionary? sex. Wait, that's news to me. Where'd you hear that one? <laughs> that's, what, that's what it used to be. That's this, oh, okay, because I was like, hmm. At one oh, point, nice. they they disparaged oral sex. That's uh, a yeah, that, that, that's, that's the whole different ball game. So yeah, yeah right. Uh, how about regulate diet, food and drink, hunger and or fasting, fast and testimony meeting, word of wisdom, uh, manipulation and deprivation of sleep, not necessarily uh, financial exploitation, manipulation or dependence. That's an interesting interesting detail. I think we can agree that Mormonism taking 10% of your tithing and withholding your salvation until you pay up on that tithing, that sure does Wait, seem like financial exploitation. Well, tithing, oh. is salvation. No, t- tithing has never been salvific. Sal- 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 tithing, tithing was how um, it, you get benefits while you're on the earth. While you're, while you're living, you should get tithe and you get benefits. It was never something to say you can't be saved if you don't have tithing. I've never heard of that one. Initially, how it's practiced, well, today, how it's yeah, practiced today you have well, to go by what it's to get into the temple. You have to get into the temple to get to Mormon heaven. Ah, interesting. Well, you, ha- you have to you have to be tithing to have your endowments. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. Um, which actually doesn't that make the the lifting the priesthood ban a bit more insidious? So not only were they withholding um, the the Melchizedek priesthood from uh, people of color. They were making it, not giving them the Melchizedek priesthood meant so they could never get to the ultimate Mormon heaven. Well, so, after, after, wow. after the dead, they could get it afterwards. Uh, not even then, because the, the priesthood was with still withheld from African Americans. Anybody with the, the blood well, of the seed uh, of Cain? This is again, crazy. Joseph Smith gave Elijah Abel the Melchizedek. No, he gave Yeah, the, but he, we he are not. Yeah. But the Utah church is not Joseph Smith's church. No, I, I agree with Brigham you. Young's church. That's so, Young's church. So, um, okay. So that's under Version. behavior control. There are a lot more in that. Let's go to information. And I think this is a lot of what we've discussed today is going to strike tendencies of the information control. So we have deception, anti-Mormon lies, right? Deliberately withholding information, distorting information to make it more acceptable, systematically lying to the cult members. We can, you know, point to the whitewashing scrubbing of Mormon history to uh, to uh, substantiate that point or check that box. Um, minimize or discourage discourage access to non cult sources of information. Anti Mormon literature compartmentalize information into outsider versus insider doctrines. Anti Mormon literature encourage spying on other members. There's something that the church has called the Strengthening Church Members Com- uh, Committee, the SCMC, which does exactly that. Um, extensive use of cult generated information and propaganda, the enzyme magazine, the, the, uh, whatever, fill in the blank. <laughs> well, you, can you, can you, what do you call it? Cause I call it, call it the ensign and you, you call it the enzyme, the enzyme. That's what I call it. That's the, the Utah word. Really? Yeah. Cause I, I, I've always called it the ensign. 
Well, at first I thought you said enzyme. Stuff. I'm like, they got a biology mag? What's up with that? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what you said. I, I, I call it the ensign, but okay, now that I, yeah. I know what you're referring to. Um, so that's that's under uh, information control. There's a lot more we can get into with that. Um, let's go to thought control. So we have require members to internalize the group's doctrine as truth. I like to bear my testimony. I know this church is true. I love my mom and dad. I know Joseph Smith was a prophet. How many times do you see a five-year-old getting up on the stand in fast and testimony meetings saying those exact same words parroted from one Sunday to the, from one month to the next month to the next month to the next month. And they start by having their parents kneel down next to them while they're standing up on the pulpit, speaking into a microphone where their parents whisper that testimony to them so that they can bear their testimony in church. Uh, we have changing a person's name and identity. You get your temple name. Uh, use of load, use of loaded language and cliches without constricted knowledge. Um, stopping critical thoughts and reducing complex complexities into platitudinous buzzwords. Anti-Mormon literature. I'll say that again. Um, uh, hypnotic techniques are used to alter mental states that can that can be loosely defined as sacrament meeting you go in um it, particularly a fast and testimony meeting you're already in a starved deprived state of mind you go in and you sing hymns and then you hear talks that are on specific dictated topics given by the bishop you sing more hymns and then you get to go home and then you're outside of it um uh, rejection of rational analysis critical thinking and constructive criticism once again anti-mormon literature so let's move on to the emotional control. I think this is possibly the most powerful point that the, the LDS church checks a lot of these boxes. We have manipulate and narrow the range of feelings. Some emotions and or needs are deemed as evil, wrong, or selfish, like having sexual tendencies at all, whether they be straight, gay, um, non-gender binary, non-hetero or homosexual, um, any tendencies that's something that is uh, sexual attraction outside of marriage and acting on those attractions, that is unacceptable in the church. Um, you teach emotion-stopping techniques to block feelings of homesickness, anger, and doubt. Uh, that that seems to strike tendencies on the mission, particularly. The mission is a, a hyperdrive version of the cult tendencies within the church. Um Promoting feelings of guilt or unworthiness, such as identity guilt, you're not living up to your potential, your family is deficient, your past is suspect, your affiliations are unwise, don't hang out with those friends, they're bad, your thoughts, feelings, and actions are irrelevant or selfish, you have social guilt or historical guilt, um, then you instill fear of, uh, you instill such as fear of uh, thinking independently, fear of the outside world, fear of enemies, anti-Mormons. Fear of losing one's salvation, fear of leaving or being shunned by a group. Um, then we have extremes of emotional highs and lows. We won't get into that. Um, we have phobia indoctrination, which is inculcating irrational fears about leaving the group or questioning the leader's authority. Don't you dare become one of those anti-Mormons. Don't start reading that anti-Mormon literature because then you're going to fall away. Your whole family will dis will be disappointed in you. Um, and then, of course, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Ritualistic and sometimes public confessions of sins. That's the last one that I'll read in that. Um, I can't see how bishops, any of that doesn't fit every religion, though. I mean, yeah, well, that, that's that what I was going to say. Yeah, let me, let me address this. That. I, yeah. I don't think these are good arguments, to be honest with you, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, and, and not just from my anecdotal personal experience, because um, half the stuff you said I I've never saw in the church. Um, I, I agree there's a little— Really? A, hang on. Really? There's a, there's a little bit of level on some of, wow. of, of this for any religion, right? Um, oh, yeah. But I, I was not discouraged by reading anti-Mormon literature. In fact, when I was investigating the church, I would I was familiar with the, the Tanners, right? Sandra and, and, and Gerald Tanner. I, I was encouraged to go ask people about it. I, I never They never said, don't read any of that. Never once did anybody ever tell me that. Wow. Um, I was never discouraged. My friends— I was I was raised with with Mormons most of my life. They were around constantly in in my neighborhood, and my best friends were Mormons. Their family welcomed me to no end. They never treated me as an outsider. They would take me to church for years, even though I never I didn't get baptized until I was seventeen. I met them when I was six. That we went to Boy Scouts, we went to jamborees that were, were led by the LDS. Never once did they even try to get me to convert. I, the only reason I converted was not because they were pushing me into it. This is it, it, it's a long story of why I converted, um, and it had to do, do with with a girl and and a really spiritual feeling that I had. And I'm going to be addressing that on somebody's channel next week. Love I believe. bombing, but uh, but they it's never called love bombing. That no, is, no, 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 no. Hang on. You're, let me finish my, my thing okay, here. Sorry. These are my friends, my best friends for years. I mean, from six, from age six to, to 17, many, many friends um, that were LDS, 
but never once did they ask me to convert. Never, we didn't, I didn't even talk about the church with them. I didn't know anything about the church until I was like 15 or 16 when I was going, okay, what the hell do you guys really believe? I mean, I, I hang out with you guys. We go to the church the meetings. I like the girls, um, but I never really asked them about the doctrine, right? But uh, I happened to like one girl, and I was taking and, – and, I had a, a sensation. I had a, what I thought was the Holy Ghost, even though I didn't know what the hell it was at the time. I'd asked them what, what what just happened there, and they said, "Oh, that's the Holy Ghost." And I was like, "Okay, what the heck's going on here? There might be something to this." And then I started reading the Book of Mormon and, and asking more questions. And but I it still at the same time was reading the Gerald uh, Gerald Tanner and them, and I was like, "Well, what about this stuff?" Well, and like you said, and you hit it on the nail. And they had the LDS, like them, hate them, whatever. They have what they have decent answers to a lot of things. They have worked to really have, like you said, logical responses to things. Um, Jeff Lindsay, I think his name is. Um, are you familiar with him? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's he has a whole blog on this stuff. Um, and I'm not saying that that I agree with their answers, but they have thought these things through. They have a very good in depth narrative. Um, I think where they fall apart is in the archaeological department because that's hard. To really do apologetics for, I I, I don't not see do not at all see the apologetics for the archaeological expert you know expertise that they say oh well you know we found this and it's it's it's, it's relating to the um, the swords that they're talking about in uh, the Book of Mormon or horses relating to this little pygmy type thing that existed in Central America, yeah. but as far <laughs> as your, your what you were talking about those individual things. Um, I think that you can apply those to anything, and on a very small scale, sure, that that exists ubiquitously in all religions. But can you agree that the degree, and I list, and, and again, I'm talking about a degree scale here, because I think it's important that you can't just lump everything. Either it has this, it fits this. There are degrees in each one of these things. Would you say that something like Scientology is epically more cult-like than something like the LDS Church? No. Kyle, I before well, let me ask you, Bryce, Bryce, bef- you, uh, you no, I want I want to dive into what Kyle thinks about the list that we went through, what Kyle thinks about what you just said, Steve, and I want you to substantiate why you just said no. I I, I think that um, well, for me, to, for what Steve said, I think that just because you didn't have any experience with that, I don't think that based on what he read, anybody can say that they that does not exist within the. The Mormon Church. You know, you, you may have gotten lucky. Just like with me, uh, being gay, and, and when I came out, I didn't have the the problem of people, you know, judging me or losing family members or anything like that. I had a relatively good experience with it. I didn't lose anybody, but I, I wouldn't say that um, that therefore no one gets uh, you know treated unfairly when they come out. It's it's I just I got lucky. And I think the same thing. In your case, you, you just got lucky with not having those kind of experiences. Well, I mean, I went, but, I went to numerous boards. It's not just like one. I mean, well, but I'm just saying, like, uh, if if you if you look at what he 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 tapped out, and the reason I answered no, I wouldn't say that Scientology is epically, um, I sure more do. so a cult than than Mormonism, and that's because if you go by the what he just read, the checklist, they they both click it. Now, are there worse aspects to one than the other? Sure, but when we're talking about cult. I don't think so. Now, well, is one more dangerous for you than than the other? Yeah, definitely. I was, but I was in gonna terms of say, being a cult, I was going to say as far as what Kyle said too, versus what Steve said. In my experience, I didn't really look into it till I went to college. I had a friend in college that was a Mormon. I found out he was LDS, and he was significantly older than me. And he is the one who told the elders to come to my door, and I was actually looking at it. And when you said the controlling emotions to the, and one of those emotions being homesicknesses, that was what really got me interested because I was homesick. That's something that happens when you go to another state and hmm. another city and you're all alone in that city. And you're homesick. That's one of the first things that happens as a college student is you become homesick and you you look for an outlet, any outlet. And a lot of people go to parties and stuff. Well, that's not me. I, I, I searched out a religious aspect and that the first one to come to my door was the LDS. And well, and luckily that. the LDS church has the ability to ameliorate that homesickness for eternity because families are sealed together forever. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. And you can baptize the dead. So even if your parents and and your you know your family, your extended family, even even unto that, they 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 encourage you to genealogically, and they have these wonderful genealogical. Their genealogical records are superb. 
Right. They oh, have yes. all those resources. The you best. can baptize those people. If they haven't been baptized, you can baptize as many people as you want for the dead, and then you can save them from this 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 separation because this is what they the way they explained hell when I asked them about it is that there isn't really a hell it's just you're more separated from God after yeah. you die so and that's the yeah. way I explained it so it was like this the revelation that hey I can do more for my family if I if I go this way I look at it this way like if 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 you're describing the things that make a game right what makes this a um, like Halo the game Halo if you have a checklist of things that you have to go by and check off, like what makes this a game and Halo checks off all those, then it's the same thing as, as Sonic the Hedgehog. For example, I wouldn't say that one is more a game than the other. Now, one might be more fun than the other, but I wouldn't say that one is more of a game than the other in the same way I would say that with a cult. They're both a cult because they, they get the things checked off. Yeah, one might be more dangerous than the other, but... That doesn't mean that it's not a cult. In any, I, I, I don't think in black and white though. I, I think a lot uh, th- things are so much more nuanced, and this is the problem I, I see in most types of arguments, especially when we talk about anything relating to morality or, or religion. Or people want to have this black and white dichotomy, and I think these subjects are much more gradient. I really do, especially things like this, the cult. Because what he's saying, I mean, isn't like this. Isn't one of those things where oh, you're right, I'm wrong, kind of thing, or I'm wrong, you're right, or whatever. It's not like that. These are different ways of, of looking at a situation, and what do you want? attributing a label to depending on what you your criteria are for but i mean do you do you, do you question the question i asked earlier do you think that scientology is much more cult-like than mormonism it depends um i've never attended scientology i didn't grow up in it um i know mormon culture i know utah mormon culture specifically which has something in and of itself and it sounds like you partook of multiple mormon cultures but by and large the Mormonism that you experienced was California Mormonism, which they're seen as our liberal cousins. Like from Utah, they're, they're like, <laughs> they're, oh yeah, that's there's true. just California Mormons. Green they Jello, do baby, green Jello. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do I even want to know? <laughs> <laughs> that's another thing we didn't we didn't even get into the uh, the. I wanted to ask about the magic if, underwear, but it doesn't yeah, seem like Mormon, we're Yeah, if you're Mormon, you're never looking green Jello ever again. And oh, yeah, you know, you can touch on that real quick. I mean, I, I, real quick. I mean. Do, do, uh, do you, Bryce? When do you, do you when you hear the term magic underwear? Do you do you have this kickback like I do? Go look at. No Mormon thinks they're magical. I think I think that's this flagrant nonsense. Come on now, Steve. No, no, I've never been a Mormon that thinks it's magical. Not one. Have you? Uh, the point yeah, same here. Yeah, that's that is actually offensive to say it's magic underwear. That is uh, that's offensive to most Mormons. Um, I mean, just, if, you if you're if you're ever talking to Mormons and you say, "Tell me about your magic underwear," they will be offended. I almost promise you. Interesting. Um, yeah, because so it, it's not they don't think it's magical. So why are people attributing that that quality, quality yeah. or property to them? Good They're question. a spiritual reminder, just like somebody with a cross. Now, it's the same thing to a Christian. You go to a Christian or, or Catholic and you say, "Hey, you have a crucifix." That's a magical thing, right? Now, I think Aaron Ra would probably do that because he probably thinks that he thinks that anything symbology would be a symbol of magic. I get that. Right. But but it's still offensive to the person because the Catholics don't think that a crucifix is magical. They don't think a rosary is magical. It's offensive to to Catholics if you say you have a magical bead thing. No, it's not magical. Why it's underwear though? For, for the underwear because it's supposed to be a a, a reminder to, to to your covenants to you made, that you made with God inside the temple. That's all. And, that, and reminder is uh, synonymous with boner killer in this aspect, that's right? Like, and like, very, very yeah, and it, it stops from having affairs. Like, well, but, but also there is a certain aspect of all of the anecdotes of people saying like, oh, I was in a fire or, you know, I heard a story about a person who was in a fire and they were burned all over their body except for the garments. The fire retardant. <laughs> well, yeah. I, well, you talk wow. about having, you know, you're wearing a polyester, um, you know, suit that's you know, it's gonna it's another layer of cloth it's going to insulate you um but, there but, there are a ton of anecdotes a ton of stories about wartime heroes who march into battle and their all of their clothes are shot up but, but never any of their garments are ever scathed like there are those magical stories sure. and i think that's I, I where that. the magic underwear trope kind of uh derives from but um to mormons that is that is offensive they are the garments agree, they are though, the sacred looked- garments if people want to to offend people and they want to call magic, I get that. Right, it's Satanism. 
is mm-hmm. all about offending the Christians. I understand that. But if you want to have a dialogue with somebody and you want to have a conversation with a Mormon, you start off with Mormon, uh, you know, magic underwear, they're just going to look at you like you're an idiot. They really are. It, yeah. it does nothing to add to a conversation whatsoever. Yeah. And same thing with you. If you asked about the temple endowments, do you actually do Masonic symbols in the, the temple endowments? Most of them aren't going to know the analogies or the, the similarities. Right. But they, are, they do exist. The Freemasonry mm-hmm. aspect, we all know with the, 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 the straight edge and the, I, I mean, it, it is some Freemason. There's a long story, fascinating story behind that, though. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I just actually episode 100 of my show. I, I went through a lot of the history of of Masonry and Mormonism and mm-hmm. how the two are inextricably tied. And that's what it, what the episode was titled for that very reason. Um, so, that, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think one thing that we can take away from the last couple of minutes of conversation is there are certain subjects which are taboo to talk to a Mormon about, especially if you just walk up to them on the street <laughs> and say, tell me about your underwear. They're going to be offended. They're not going to talk to you because. They see that they're, whatever conversation is going to happen, gonna you go are going fast. to tell them anti-Mormonism, right. or anti-Mormon lies, or you are not an insider. I'm not going to cast my pearls before swine. Interesting. That's, you that. that, that's called the entrenchment effect. The entrench, the indoctrination effect, the cult effect. Can I answer the question in the conversation that we were getting to earlier? Well, the entrenchment, <laughs> that before this entrenchment is not the same as a cult effect. The, the entrenchment is actually uh, the backfire effect. But when you talk about nice the cult, stuff, to get back, nice get back, yeah, we'll get back to the cult thing real quick. Um, you honestly don't think that something like Scientology, which does use uh, mind control techniques, um, the LDS Church, of course, any church has indoctrination. That's a, that's a given. Religion well, is a doctrine. Steve, Steve, I think but the I important point, I want to reflect exactly what you said. You said, I try not to think in black and white, everything is a gradient. That is exactly how I prefaced the entire conversation. And before I read, I went on that, you know, seven minute screed reading through everything that's on freedomofmind.com uh, that Stephen Hassan has constructed in the bite model because what we talked about is merely a checklist that the more boxes that a religion or any cult of personality or a, a, any movement, any meme, any uh, subreddit, whatever, any time that they check more of those boxes, they tick further and further up the scale towards being defined uh, could, as a cult. Uh, the Boy Scouts would be a cult under those definitions. That is interesting you say that. That is very interesting because I, I think that to a certain extent that may be the case, but you have to say – by Stephen Hassan's definition, is it a positive cult or is it a negative cult? And are there certain redeeming qualities that may mitigate any of the negative factors that that the Boy Scouts of America, the sorry, should I say the Scouts of America now, yeah. um, happens to <laughs> happens to use or happens Scouts. to to uh, provide for their followers or f- provide for their members? Do those positives outweigh the negatives? And if so, then we can look at it as a positive cult of personality, and that's awesome, right? Like it's teaching kids how to like how to you know shoot 22s and how to row a boat and how to how to do all of the cool scout stuff how to camp how to make a shelter in the wilderness like i have my eagle scout because i love scouts i absolutely love scouts but do you agree if, I if mean, somebody yeah. were to call scouts a cult though because the modern definition or the the popular definition of cult is often painted with heaven's gate and jim jones i would be offended well, let me, let in me a previous you, life I, I, let me ask you because Again, I agree there's cults of personality, and I, and I think that you could make a case for this positive cults, okay? But that's that's a superficial thing because we have to re- realize that when we talk about cult in this type of, of, of situation, when we're on these these channels and we're talking about cult, there and people are not going to think about the, the, the psychological versions you're using. They're not going to think of a positive cult. They hear the word cult. It is automatically a pejorative. So, so use I, it more if, and use it more accurately. Agreed. Don't be don't be afraid of the term. Use it correctly. Uh, and, and I and, and I, I usually I'm I'm behind that. I, I think that that takes the sting out of things by using things correctly. Ask Kyle. I'm 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 not a pendant, but I do think that being specific on certain things makes a difference in these conversations. That's why this is weird, Steve. But, That's why but, this is weird because you normally aren't like this. Well, because like, again, nothing is black and white. You don't have to be the same for everything because I, I see where he's coming from, but I think he can actually agree with me as well. By labeling something a cult, even if you're trying to, to say, hey, it's a positive cult, um, that's not what you're trying to say with Mormon. You're not saying Mormonism is a positive cult. Right. Um, and so you, you, it leaves a lot of vagary when you just say, oh, I believe that this particular thing is a cult because it could be ubiquitous among any types of religions. So, I mean, that is, ooh, that is, that's an interesting point. When and where do you use that word? Yeah, no. I, What's it, your it, audience, it, right? Yeah, exa- exactly. And that's a, that's a big point. Where's your audience? Um, 
you know, if I'm talking to a uh, bunch of people, if I have a group and I am talking about mind control, if I'm talking about more importantly indoctrination, I yeah. think it might be more uh, useful to use cult in, in, in a very specific way by people that have been committing, you know, the Jim John, Jones, uh, Jonestown where people died because of mind control. If I just say, hey, I'm talking about just religious indoctrination, that's not being a cult. That's just religion. I disagree. Um, that but, is a cult. As a cult. I, I disagree with them. Like I it, said, are what they saying true? Is what on. they is what they saying? Or is that true or not? Like, are Kyle, they are they preaching on, misinformation? Kyle, Steve, I, I want to ask before before we dive into answering that question, Steve, based on the criteria that I posed and the examples that I provided that seem to check a number of those boxes, would you agree that by the definition that is provided by Stephen Hassan's bite model, that the LDS church, the Mormon religion, tends to strike a lot of cult similarity, or uh, it checks a lot cult. of the boxes that cult make ish. it seem like a cult? Cult-ish if you take the, each box at its bare minimum. And again, that's why I think it's important to have a gradient. Just because you barely can be able to talk, you know, tick a box off i don't think that's a standard qualifier of what we should label things called but again it's just but a use it's of also word. it's also not the quality but also the quantity of the number of boxes that you check that's why there are so well, many again, criteria you agree, within you agree by that definition boy scouts is a cult is halo is, cult? is halo a game ish is, people, is, is people halo play like halo they spend money on it they're very fanatic are they cult the gamers yeah, but what I'm, no what i'm saying what i'm saying is, cult? Is, yeah. it's either is yes. or it's not See, game, yeah. see, see, so you're saying that people that play gamers, hardcore gamers, that's a cult. By the same definitions, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. See, to me, it, it just waters point. down the word cult. It, it leaves us all meaning. If any kind of group it that has these attributes, which is pretty much all groups, fall into that really. When you have that many check things, a checklist, the problem is now you're running into a, 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 a camera that a fallacy, but you, you have so many things that it's applying to. That it, it basically has no meaning when you you if you that, want to have hang a, on no 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 that a very is, small checklist. I have to say okay, so that is where this is breaking. Where I think there may be a miscommunication in this conversation because the point of uh, defining a cult with these definitions is to identify whether it is using mind control to some extent. Now, that the w the qualifier behind that sentence is. There are good cults. There are bad cults. That is a spectrum that cults lie on. There, there, spect there are cults that are somewhat good and otherwise bad. There are some cults that are somewhat bad and otherwise good. So that, I think, is the important definition that Steve Hassan uses on, um, on Freedom of Mind. He says, and let me find it. Um, I developed the bite model to help people determine whether or not a group is practicing destructive mind control. Because we talked about earlier, if it's using constructive mind control, if a cult is helping you quit smoking or quit drinking or helping you to uh, be more, you know, ha budget yourself better or whatever the case may be, that can be a good cult. Okay. Continuing, the buy model helps people understand how cults suppress individuals member, individual members' uniqueness and creativity. That is the point, is it is removing the locus of control from the individual to conforming with the group. And we have to ask, is that always a good thing? Now, that's a, that, that's, that's a deep question, right? If you are an individual and you are in a massive crowd of people that are running away from an active shooter, it doesn't help you to think individually and say, I'm going to run towards a shooter. It helps you to use, my, or to use the psychology of the entire group and run away. Right. So there are times where group think and group mind control is effective, useful and necessary in order military. to accomplish something. The military. Oh, yes. Mind control. Ooh, the, so the military, military a being a cult. Oh, a good that's, cult. Yeah. But that's, again, I, 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 I good cult. Did you say good cult? Kai? He's calling I did. it a good cult. I did. Ooh, yeah, you, again, that is interesting. If you want to use that it? model, but not everybody uses that model. Well, I, wouldn't, I, I, I know I'm you're going, going the there. Military I know where you're cult. going there. <laughs> it just makes no sense to me to call the military a good cult. If you, if, does he, I think does I know he, where you're going there. <laughs> does, does, he, does Steve Hassan, does he break it down in his book, Military Religion? Does he even call all that cults? I don't mentioned? know if he refers to the military as a religion. I think he, or as he a cult. Not, not as religion, but as a cult. And then does he refer to the military as a cult and religion as a cult, all religions as a cult? Or just, I, 
Uh, no, I I think he's very stark that he does not qualify all religions as cults, that's and up. that's the point that he that he is making in the just the introduction. And I will point people to freedomofmind.com because that does articulate that not all religions are cults. Okay, a lot of religions strike cult like tendencies. Does, does but on. there are things that are not religions that are cults. Does he specifically point out Mormonism in the book? If I can ask, I don't think he does. No, I so I haven't read You're, the so book. Just, I just want to get on the record. Page. He's not specifically pointing out Mormonism, but you're taking what he's reading and you're attributing it to your your knowledge of Mormonism. Is that correct? Yes, oh, yeah, absolutely. Fair enough. And, uh, that, and well, that's your well, I, Which I, ones wouldn't be considered a, re a religion? I'm interested in that too. Which or a cult? You mean? I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. Which ones wouldn't be considered well, how about a religion? This? I, I mean, if you want to talk about cult like, I mean, I've seen a lot more kind of cultist behavior. And let's talk about behaviors, not so much what the what your your conditions are, but behaviors I think are important. Um, I've seen things from Calvinist to me seems very much cult like. Yes, like okay. very much cult like. Okay, but I'm, I'm not going to call them a cult. But I well, will maybe a little. Bit. Sometimes I, I maybe I do. I, I can't say that I don't. But they are extremely cult like. In, in, in if you ever go to the Council of Google Plus, it's almost disturbing how cult like they are. The cult um, of Google Plus. I don't see the. I don't see Mormonism anywhere near the level of the cult of. of cult like of the council of google plus i mean they're not even the same realm of, of that level of cult being cult like i think so you I just think got a soft the, spot maybe a nostalgia no a nostalgia no spot again um, I I, i'm trying to be objective as possible that's, 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 um that's, 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 i, I have i have ex i have been to many different words i don't see what they're seeing now i may concede this being a convert to the church as we agreed earlier is different from being born in the covenant. It, it, it does have a different thing to it. I, I can't. And Utah it. Mormonism is different than California Mormonism, I, 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 and and like and and but spending your entire Utah, life in the church is a lot different than spending a couple of years in the church too. I, I, I lived in three different places in Utah, so I've got some pretty random sampling. I lived in St. George. Uh, I actually lived in Ivan, St. George, uh, and uh, outside Huntington. Um, and you're right that that style of Mormonism is a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit more, I'm not going to use the word fanatical, but they are a lot more extreme than the California ones. When you say Mormons in California, the liberal ones, I know exactly what you mean by that. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I, I think a, a takeaway that we can pull from all of this, um, I think I might have lost you. Um, you you, you, you lost, lost you. your camera feed. Lost the camera. So my Skype just crashed. I may be disconnecting here. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but since you can still hear me, I'm going to keep on going. But, but it is funny. We agree on like 99% of everything else, though. I think there's one well, issue. And, and I is, don't think you know. that we disagree about Mormonism being a cult. I think it's just where we happen to drop that point of so something strikes cult. Um, am, I, am I cutting out? Are you guys no, still able good. to hear me? Okay. You're good. Um, it, I think I think where the 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 point of disagreement happens to be is where we drop the pin on something being not a cult versus a cult. If something happens to, to check 15 of these boxes in the bite model, it is a cult versus it seems like if if something is strike is checking 30 of these boxes by your standard, it is not quite considered a cult. So I think it's just a matter of where we drop that pin I'm okay where the with disagreement that. comes in. Yeah, no, so. I, to I totally agree with that. Yeah. Okay. But I got to admit, I, I, I'm really blown away the the, the knowledge level you have. It's yeah, impressive. Will, you, will you come join us again sometime? That. I would absolutely love to. This is uh, this has been an extremely interesting and, and fascinating conversation. I really want to thank you guys and and thank you for sharing your experience and and uh, thank you for asking questions. Seriously, anytime somebody wants to say, "Hey, come on to my show and talk Mormonism," I'm all about it. So uh, thanks for extending the invite and thanks for being yeah. informed on the subject matter and, and asking these deeper questions. It was a lot of fun. How about next we'll time? You, um, you know, if you want to get into it, let's talk about the 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 FLDS. Oh yes, um, that'd be a good topic. I have sure. much less that, knowledge. You got to admit, those guys so. are a lot more, even way out there than just your typical. They're movie. a lot more similar to Joseph Smith's, though. They are the they are fundamentalists. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, but they are. I, 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 I was not too far from a place called Hilldale. You familiar with that? I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, area, they yeah. are. They live like there in the 1800s. And I'm not talking on a Quaker way. They are just. Oh, that's back that's all thanks to Warren Jeffs. Before Warren, Warren Jeffs, Jeffs yeah. got there, he's they were so much that way. Yeah, yeah, he's a prison. We uh, this is giving me. A, this is giving me a, a I um, like this guy. A, a new him? idea for the one a debate that we'll have coming up. It, are religions a cult? I think that would be a uh, a fabulous thing. Well, to, have a, to the book I was trying to think of earlier was called uh, Kingdom of the Cults, um, and they they talk yeah. about a lot of that stuff. Okay. Well, cool. Well, uh, Bryce, we will have you back for sure. This was uh, fantastic. This was uh, we actually. 
we went way over the, the 90 minutes, I thought. So, and it yeah. felt like an hour. So, I mean, that's great when that happens. Anytime yeah. that it, it goes, it goes by fast. That's good. And um, all, the, all the good topics go by fast. All the yes, ones that are boring. Right? Like, oh my right? God, are we over yet? <laughs> and, uh, and, and to everybody out there, uh, once again, thank you, Dave, for uh, producing for us. And then you guys will see you tomorrow at seven for the epic battle between the, uh, <laughs> the Legion of Atheists and the Jesus League. Take care, everybody.